Good afternoon, everybody. Please be seated. Routine proceedings, introduction of bills, committee reports, the Honourable Member for Rossmere. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I wish to present the third report of the Standing Committee on Legislative Affairs. Your standing committee on legislative affairs is the following. The Honourable Member for Rossmere. Madam Speaker, I move, seconded by the Honourable Member for Kildonan River East, that the report of the committee be received. It has been moved by the Honourable Member for Rossmere, seconded by the Honourable Member for Kildonan River East, that the report of the committee be received. Is it the pleasure of the House to accept the motion? Agreed? Agreed and so ordered. Further committee reports, the Honourable Member for Portage La Prairie. Madam Speaker, I wish, wish to present the fourth report of the Standing Committee on Legislative Affairs. Your standing committee on legislative Dispense affairs the honourable member for Portage La Prairie. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move, seconded by the honourable member for Brown and West, that the report of the committee be received. It has been moved by the Honourable Member for Portage La Prairie, seconded by the Honourable Member for Brandon West, that the report of the committee be received. Is it the pleasure of the House to adopt the motion? Agreed? Agreed, Agreed and so ordered. Tabling of reports, ministerial statements, the Honourable Minister for Status of Women, and I would indicate that the required 90 minutes notice prior to routine proceedings was provided in accordance with our Rule 27 Bracket 2. Would the Honourable Minister please proceed with her statement? Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Today I have the wonderful pleasure of hosting a women's empowerment celebration here at the Manitoba Legislature with more than 50 remarkable red hat ladies from across our great province. The Red Hat Society began in 1998 between two friends who celebrated their 50th birthdays with the gifting of a red fedora. The red hat soon became a tradition that signified sisterhood and the celebration of aging together. Easily identifiable with their bold and enthusiastic shades of purple, red, and pink, along with a unique red hat that signifies each woman's vibrant personality, this sisterhood has become a symbol for celebrating age in style. Manitoba's first red hat chapter opened in 2000. The Hatters, as they call themselves, pride themselves on being a membership focused on fun, friendship and food and are committed to helping reshape how mature women are valued in today's culture. These women have created a community where women are welcomed and accepted as they celebrate this new chapter in their life. The Hatters also ensure they are helping one another through periods of isolation and loneliness that sometimes and unfortunately comes with aging. They defy any attitude that does not support and celebrate the values and contributions women make at all stages of life, regardless of their age. Madam Speaker, the work of the Red Hat Society is essential to making women feel heard and offers unconditional amounts of support and praising one another. I want to thank these women for their devotion to supporting others and inspiring women to stay true to themselves and have fun doing it. Madam Speaker, I ask all my colleagues to help welcome these remarkable women into our gallery today and help me proclaim April 25th as Red Hat Society Day.
Uh, the Honourable Minister for Status of Women. Madam Speaker, I ask for leave to have all of these ladies' names entered into Hansard. Nice. Is there leave to allow those names into Hansard? Nice. Leave has been granted. And also, I would indicate that I have allowed the member to wear a red hat in the chamber. Uh, she is authorized to do so. And I kind of think it would have been a nice day, too, for the speaker to change her hat into a red one. Jazz it up a little bit. The Honourable Member for St. John's. Madam Speaker, in 1998, Red Hat Society founder Sue Ellen Cooper brought her dear friend a red hat. Sue was inspired by a line in a Jenny Joseph poem that read, When I am an old lady, I shall wear purple with a red hat which doesn't go and doesn't suit me. End quote. From this, friends began wearing and going out in public with purple clothing and red hats. The Red Hat Society was born. Over the next several decades, the Red Hat Society grew to be a worldwide membership society with a goal of encouraging women to get the most out of life. Today, the Red Hat Society exists in over 20 countries with chapters in every province in Canada. At its peak, Manitoba was home to 165 chapters with over 4,000 members. Many women put so much time and energy into their family, career, and community, but don't take enough time for ourselves to just have fun, Madam Speaker. And so the goal of the Red Hat Society is to give women a break from the responsibilities of everyday life for no other purpose than to just have fun with other women and to look good while doing so. Members of the Red Hat Society can be easily recognized by the bright colors they wear, red hats and purple clothing for members over 50, and pink hats and lavender clothing for members under the age of 50. This year, the Red Hat Society will celebrate their 25th anniversary. To mark that occasion, the Winnipeg chapter is hosting its All About the Hat Gala on April 29th at the Norwood Hotel. The all-day gala will feature vendors, dinner, prizes, and so much fun. On behalf of our uh, NDP caucus, we say congratulations on the mail, uh, milestone and to many, many more years. Miigwech. The Honourable Member for Tyndall Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I ask for leave to respond to the Minister's statement. Does the member have leave to respond to the Ministerial yeah. statement? Yeah. Leave has been granted. The Honourable Member for Tyndall Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and while I recognize that I am not yet 50, it brings me great joy to rise in the House today to recognize the Red Hat Society. Madam Speaker, the Red Hat Society is a fun group for women who focus on living life to the fullest. The group stands for and celebrates strong, independent women who are unapologetically themselves, embracing life and supporting each other. The Society started in the late 90s and was inspired by a beautiful poem titled Warning by Jenny Joseph. It is about embracing the joys of being yourself because life is beautiful. The Society grew to have 167 chapters at one point and currently has 13 chapters in Winnipeg and seven in rural Manitoba. And today, they celebrate 25 years here in Manitoba. Now, why is the group called the Red Hat Society? Well, from a single gift of re a red hat, it has grown into a symbol for women around the globe as they turn 50 and enter the next fun phase of their lives. Here in Manitoba, members who have reached the fabulous age of 50 years wear red hats and purple clothing. Women under 50 are pink hat divas and wear pink hats and lavender clothes. We can see this on the beautiful and strong women who are up in our galleries right now. Madam Speaker, I want to thank the Red Hat Society in Manitoba for being an inspiration to so many of us and for your outlook on life. I will end by reading a fun motto the Red Hat Society in Manitoba lives by. 
Life should not be a journey to the grave with the intention of arriving safely in an attractive, well-preserved body, but rather to skid in sideways, champagne in hand, strawberries in the other, body thoroughly used up, totally worn out, and screaming, woohoo, what a ride. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member statements. The Honourable Member for Swan River. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to recognize and honour the late Helgi Jones, who many affectionately referred to as the Premier of Heckle Island. Born in 1916 at an early age of 13, Helgi joined his father in the family fishing operations on Lake Winnipeg. Helgi married Frances Hurst and they made their home at Heckle Island. Over the years, Helgi accumulated a very impressive resume of working for his community he so loved. In the 1950s, Helgi was instrumental in securing grant money to build a road across the island. And when finances ran out, he organized volunteers to complete the uh, bush clearing by hand. Helgi demonstrated his leadership over and over. And when he set out on a mission, it was accomplished. Like when Hecla Island needed hydro, he made a presentation and Hecla got hydro. In the 1960s, Helgi became chair of the Area Development Board, lobbying for a causeway to Hecla and to name Hecla Island as a provincial park. By the early 1970s, both missions were accomplished. Later that year, Helgi attended Marine School in Thunder Bay, earning his late captain papers. This inspired him to design and build the Lady Francis, a fishing vessel which improved living and working conditions on Lake Winnipeg. He was honoured by fishermen for his dedication to the fishing industry, <clears throat> receiving a commemorative medal to honour persons who made a significant contribution to their fellow citizens and the community. Madam Speaker, Helgi was instrumental in making Hecla Island the place it is today. It was only fitting on June 23, 2017, Helgi Jones Parkway was named to honour his legacy. Pat, Marjorie, Stewart, Ellen, Murray, and families, you are rightfully extremely proud of Helgi's accomplishments. I welcome Helgi's family here today and ask for leave to include their names and a list of his many accomplishments in the answer to honour his legacy. Colleagues, please join me in welcoming his family to the Legislature today. The member did not need leave in uh, that particular instance. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Union Station. This week is Early Childhood Educator Week. I am pleased to have the opportunity today to thank all of Manitoba's dedicated and hardworking early childhood educators and expend, extend <laughs> a special thank you to the Union Station early childhood educators in our community. ECEs cannot be overlooked, cannot continue to be overlooked rather by this PC government and need to be given the respect they deserve through funding, wages, protections and actions. Child care centres in Union Station are doing amazing work to make sure that children are well socialised and well taken care of. They make extraordinary efforts to keep kids safe and enjoy our neighbourhood's parks and amenities while being a source of important information and relationships for so many families. Childcare should be affordable for all parents regardless of income. However, affordable childcare means nothing if there aren't enough staff or centres for all kids. ECEs invest in obtaining their education and training. Their skills, dedication and essential service has not been respected by this government, which is why we're struggling to ensure that affordable childcare is available to all Manitobans across our province. Most ECEs are earning inadequate wages, which makes it harder to attract new workers to the field and leads to many leaving the field in order to find better paying work. Honouring ECEs is a nice gesture, but nice gestures from this PC government are not a substitute for actual actions taken to retain and recruit ECEs to the field. This government can and should do much more to support the early childhood educator section, sector in our province by taking bold steps to ensure that childcare is fully accessible 
truly affordable for all Manitobans, and that ECEs are adequately supported, resourced, and compensated. Thank you to all the incredible Union Station Early Childhood Educators. Our NDP caucus stands with you and is committed to real action being taken to support you. Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Advanced Education and Training. Madam Speaker, it is not uncommon for members of this assembly to invite talented young artists to be recognized in the chamber. Some have even gone on to become quite famous. Today is my turn to highlight an amazing young man from Fort Richmond whose musical talents are already reaching international audiences. Yeho Estioko is an impressive pop and R&B singer who writes his own lyrics and music. Starting at the age of four, Yeho showed advanced skills in his vocal abilities, and with the encouragement from his musical family, he has taken the talent to very new heights. This young musician also plays a number of instruments, including the acoustic guitar, bass guitar, drums, French horn, trumpet, piano, and ukulele. Madam Speaker, I was excited to join Yeho at the launch of his very first album called I Hope on February the 18th of this year. The room was full of adoring fans who swooned as soon as Yeho began to croon. His voice has a rich and smooth tone that exudes a calm comfort and upbeat ambiance. Members of the house who are interested can listen on the, to the IHOP album on SoundCloud, or even better, you can join him at his next concert this Saturday, April 29th, at Rafi's Cafe on Ellis Avenue. Mm. Madam Speaker, this humble yet confident young man has his values strongly rooted in family. The connection was very evident at his album launch, where both his mother and his father shared their pride and joy in a son who has continuously shown his gratitude for their sacrifices. It is truly a gift to be able to highlight and promote the hard work of a young Manitoba youth who will be representing our province in such a positive light because of the person he is. Yeho Estioko is joined uh, by his family in the gallery today, his father Danny, his mother Jonalyn Estioko, and other family and friends. I ask my colleagues to please join me in saluting this talented young musician as he grows an exciting career in music. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Today I rise to recognize Reuse It, an environmentally friendly initiative that is meeting the needs of many in Flin Flon. Reuse It is a used item store that accepts valuable donations from community members for resale. Proceeds are then distributed to local community groups in need. Reuse It was originally founded by avid community volunteer Kathy McCormick to help fund Habitat for Humanity in Flin Flon. The store moved to its present location on Trout Lake Road in 2016 and was registered as a non-profit business in 2018. So far, Reuse It has been able to donate $21,000 back to the community. The store has supported several local groups, including the Flin Flon Cadets, Flin Flon Aboriginal Music Centre, uh, sorry, Flin Flon Aboriginal Friendship Centre, McIsaac School, Lego Club, Flin Flon Guidance Nursery School, Norman Community Services, SPCA, Bust the Winter Blues Festival, Flin Flon Ski Club and Curling Club, as well as the Flin Flon Arts Council, Community Wellness Collective, Library, North Star Quilting Guild. I'd also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the citizens of Flin Flon who have supported and continue to support Reuse It either through purchases or by donating gently used goods. Currently, Reuse It founder Kathy manages store by herself with occasional help from her husband Joe, who is the news reporter with CFAR Radio. I appreciate Kathy and Joe for the immense value they continue to add to our Flin Flon community and by extension our province, Manitoba. Their commitment to service has made a huge difference in the lives of community members and community groups. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Tyndall Park. Thank you. 
I've been working closely with seniors living in Tindo Park in creating a condensed and cohesive list of specific issues that seniors are facing and hoping this government will address immediately. Madam Speaker, these individuals have shared that they strongly feel there is a creation of a two-tier health care system happening. Many seniors cannot afford their prescribed medications, some are on fixed incomes, and some plans don't cover their medications. There are also many barriers seniors face with respect to nutrition, dental work, and eye exams. I've also heard from many constituents that the shingles shot is too expensive for seniors and we should consider covering the shingles vaccine as they do in Ontario. Further to this, it is becoming harder to access a family doctor because Manitoba has the lowest number of family physicians in the entire country. We need over 400 more doctors to even get to the national average. It is hard to get assistance in health care in a timely fashion, and it is becoming incredibly disheartening, not to mention bad for personal morale, that seniors and everyone often have to go to health facilities, sometimes for longer periods of time, far away from their own communities and their loved ones. We are supposed to be striving for community health. Seven Oaks Hospital is the closest hospital to Tyndall Park, and as our North End population continues to grow, it stands there underutilized because the provincial government won't put in the necessary investments in public health care and properly staff the facility. When it comes to home care, seniors want this service to remain public, so there's more accountability and standards. We also need to ensure there's sufficient nurses and health care aides in all long-term care facilities. Seniors need and deserve these changes as they have been ignored for far too long and it is a matter of respect and safety. I table a list of these ideas and I ask that the minister responsible if he would consider meeting with some of the seniors in my constituency about these issues. Thank you. Prior to oral questions, we have some guests in the gallery that I would like to draw your attention to. Seated in the public gallery, we have with us today Morgan Shipley and Stasia France, who are the guests of the Honourable Minister of Mental Health and Community Wellness. On behalf of all Honourable Members, we welcome you to the Manitoba Legislature. <laughs> Oral questions, the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. For years, the PCs have ignored frontline health care workers, health care aides, physicians, allied health professionals, nurses. They've tried to ask uh, for improvements and propose solutions, and time and again, they've been turned away by this Premier and by Brian Pallister before her. Now, of course, these phys physicians and other allied health professionals are speaking out and they're calling attention to the failures of the PC government. Just today, Dr. Dan Roberts wrote, and I quote, there is a clear difference between engaging private companies in an accountable and appropriate fashion versus turning the system into a pork barrel, end quote. The Premier owes Manitobans a response. Why has she turned our provincial health care system into a situation where it's being compared to a pork barrel? The Honourable First Minister. Well, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. And contrary to the information the, that uh, the Leader of the Opposition just put on the floor of the Chamber, uh, Madam Speaker, I'll put some facts on the record. Uh, it, the fact is, Madam Speaker, we're investing record amounts of uh, dollars in our health care system in the province of Manitoba, almost $8 billion, $668 million dollars more than last year. That's a 9.2% increase. That's more, not less. Madam Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition continues to put false information on the record in this chamber. We'll continue to put the facts on the record. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on a supplementary question. For seven years, this Premier helps Brian Pallister implement his agenda of cuts and then she shows up in an election year and tries to promise different. Manitobans see through that. Manitobans listen to the physicians, the physicians who have quit their task force process, the physicians at the Grace who have been bringing forward proposals only to be rejected by this government. Physicians like the one I referred to who wrote in the paper today that I quote, what is lost here is the suffering and anxiety of patients and their families and the current plight of a dedicated doctor, end quote. It's really something when physicians and other health professionals speak out like this 
to condemn a provincial government's failures to fix health care. Will the Premier admit that her government has failed to listen to the frontline experts like Dr. Dan Roberts? The Honourable First Minister. Well, Madam Speaker, we continue to listen to frontline experts, including doctors in the community, doctors like Dr. Peter McDonald, who is the head of our uh, Diagnostic and Surgical Recovery Task Force, doctors uh, like Ed Bouchelle, who is also a member of that, uh, of that task force, Madam Speaker. These are individuals who are helping us uh, move in the right direction to help eliminate uh, the backlog, the surgical and diagnostic backlogs in the province of Manitoba. And I want to thank them uh, for the incredible work that they're doing. We'll continue to take their advice, not the advice from the Leader of the Opposition. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on the final supplementary. The Premier should start to listen to those on the front lines. And she should pay close attention to the words of Dr. Dan Roberts, who told them that their approach was not going to work. He asked them instead to invest in the public system. But what did the Premier do? Well, Dr. Roberts writes that, and I quote here, as of this date, no response has been forthcoming, end quote. That's the record of the Stephenson government. That's the record when it comes to neurology. That's the record when it comes to ignoring those on the front lines of our health care system. Will the Premier tell the House and the people of Manitoba why she ignores frontline local experts like Dr. Dan Roberts? The Honourable First Minister. Well, Madam Speaker, we are listening to those on the front line, and I want to thank all of those doctors and healthcare professionals who are on our Diagnostic Surgical Recovery Task Force, Madam Speaker. People like Dr. Peter McDonald, Dr. Ed Bouchelle, Dr. Chris Christodoulou, uh, Dr. Marco Isik, Dr. Amin Kabani, Dr. Louis Oppenheimer, Dr. David Hockman, and others, Madam Speaker. We want to thank them. We are listening to them, and they are helping us. Uh, to, uh, to ensure that we deplete those uh, surgical and, uh, di diagnostic. and diagnostic backlogs. Madam Speaker, we will continue to listen to those doctors. While the Leader of the Opposition wants to make fun of me, Madam Speaker, I will continue to stand up for all Manitobans. This opposition on a new question. You'll note who the Premier doesn't thank there. Any physician or nurse or frontline health professional who disagrees with That's this right. government's cuts. Yep. On this side of the House, we know that it's the vast majority of physicians and nurses who condemn this government's cuts to health care, right. and we stand with them. That's right. Just like the allied healthcare professionals, if you want a data point for this, 7,000 allied healthcare professionals voted. 99% of them voted against this government and in favor of a potential strike action. We're talking about rural paramedics. We're talking about laboratory technologists who work to keep health facilities open across the province unlike the PCs who only work seemingly to close those sorts of facilities. Why has the government refused to treat allied health care workers with respect for the entirety of their time in office? The Honourable, the Honourable First Minister. Madam Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition is entirely disrespectful towards Dr. Peter McDonald, who is a leading orthopedic surgeon in the province of Manitoba. Madam Speaker, he is disrespectful towards Dr. Ed Bouchel, who is the provincial specialty lead of surgery, Madam Speaker. He is disrespectful towards Dr. Chris Christodoulou, the provincial specialty lead in anesthesia. Madam Speaker, the list goes on. These are individuals who are coming forward to help at the table of solutions, as the Minister of Health says, Madam Speaker, to ensure that we deplete that surgical and diagnostic backlog. That's what Man Manitobans expect from us, and we will continue to deliver on their behalf. The 
the Leader of the Official Opposition on a supplementary question. Well, there's a, a table of two at the so-called Table of Solutions, staffed by the Premier and the Minister of the Art of the Possible. On this side of the House, we stand with the 7,000 allied That's healthcare right. professionals who condemn this government's failures when it comes to health care. The situation at the Thompson General Hospital is very dire. There's a 75% vacancy rate there for lab techs. Data shared shows that one of these lab technologists was forced to work up to 47 hours straight. 47 hours straight, Madam Speaker. That's the state of health care under the PCs. Why has this Premier failed to give these allied health care professionals a fair deal, much less basic signs of respect? The Honourable First Minister. Madam Speaker, we continue to meet with frontline health care professionals, including allied health care professionals. In fact, just this morning, I met in my office with uh, one of their members, Madam Speaker, and I listened to some of the challenges and concerns. And what, one of the things that was very apparent is that there's a lot of fear mongering by the Leader of the Opposition and members uh. opposite. And that's disrespectful, Madam Speaker. We know, Madam Speaker, that collective bargaining continues to take place. We will not interfere in that process, Madam Speaker. The, the Leader of the Opposition can fearmonger all he wants, Madam Speaker, but we will continue to stand up for all of those allied health care workers who deserve to, yes, to get a collective agreement in place, Madam Speaker, and we encourage Shared Health and the Union to get together to ensure that that is done in an ex expeditious fashion, Madam Speaker. Yeah. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on the final supplementary. Madam Speaker, this Premier appoints the Board of Shared Health and she sets shared health mandate. She continuously prioritizes the bureaucracy ahead of those folks who work on the front lines of our health care system. In this year's election, you've got a choice. You can stand with the bloated PC health bureaucracy or you can stand with us who are going to fix the front lines of health care right across the great province of Manitoba. It's very disingenuous for the Premier to talk about respect when for five years she has frozen the wages of these allied health care professionals and they have been forced to carry the cost on their credit cards and lines of credit while the PC ministers benefit at the cabinet table from the financial implications of that wage freeze. Will the Premier finally admit today that they have frozen those wages for partisan political purposes and have never prioritized health care in Manitoba? The Honourable First Minister. Madam Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition is saying that we should intervene in the collective bargaining process in this, in this situation, Madam Speaker. We believe that's wrong and that is disrespectful to all of those 7,000 allied health care professionals who are working day in, day out to protect Manitobans in our health care system. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, even Theresa Oswald, back when she was Minister of Health in Manitoba, she said, I'm not, and I quote, Madam Speaker, I'm not going to presuppose the outcome outcomes of negotiations that are going on between any workforce and its employer, Madam Speaker. Oh. Theresa Oswald was right. The Leader of the Opposition is wrong. The Honourable Member for Union Station. The state of health care in this province is truly outrageous, and Manitobans know it's a crisis caused by PC cuts and this health minister's many, many failures. This morning, the Manitoba Allied Healthcare, Manitoba Association of Health Professionals, rather, revealed a critical shortage in laboratory staffing at Thompson General Hospital, which could threaten to shut down emergency room services altogether. Their president, and I quote, said lab staff are doing everything they can to keep the hospital running, but they need help and they're not getting it. We are very concerned that the few technologists who are left won't be able to hold out much, much longer." End quote. My question for the Health Ministry, is it possible that her government's five-year wage freeze is the reason she can't recruit lab the tests for Thompson has expired. she cannot...
the Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The smoke and mirrors NDP are attempting to cover up their plan for health care here in Manitoba, but I'm going to help Manitobans to connect the dots, Madam Speaker. In 2019, the Leader of the Opposition said that the Manitoba NDP would allow private home care contracts to expire if elected. Madam Speaker, right here in Winnipeg, that would mean nearly 190,000 hours less of patient care. December 28, 2022, and I'll table it, Madam Speaker, the leader then said he would not reopen Winnipeg emergency departments that were transitioned to urgent care. And just a few weeks the member's ago, time has expired. Oh, the Honourable Member for Union Station. Order. Order. The Honourable oh Member for Union Station. The staffing situation, Madam Speaker, in Thompson has steadily worsened in recent years under this PC government. Since 2020, six medical laboratory technologists have left positions in Thompson. Currently, there are only three technologists out of 12 positions actually filled. That's a 75 percent vacancy rate. Workload assessment data obtained by the Manitoba Allied Healthcare Professionals show that laboratory technologists in Thompson have been forced to work up to 47 hours straight including both full shifts and on-call to keep necessary services open to the public. Will this health minister finally accept responsibility for the staffing shortage in Thompson and her failure to pay competitive salaries and ensure there's adequate staff for the people who need them? The Honourable Minister of Health. Madam Speaker, the lab techs, not just in Thompson, but across this province, will see more vacancies according to the Leader of the Opposition, who said in debate recently with the Premier during estimates, nobody can explain the benefits of shared health and vow to cut their funding. I've asked several times in the chamber, will it be the Children's Hospital? Will it be Manitoba's Addiction Services? The Leader of the Opposition has not replied, Madam Speaker. Manitobans want to know who from the 18,000 shared health employees, lab techs and others, would the Leader of the Opposition cut here in Manitoba? The the order. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Union Station on the final supplementary. Manitobans number one priority is fixing the problems in health care, but this PC Premier and Health Minister thinks announcements in an election year after seven years of cuts is going to save their jobs. Access to services performed by specialized allied health professionals is necessary for rapid diagnosis and treatments of patients in car accidents, heart attacks, pregnancy complications, and many other medical procedures and emergencies. We know the risk, as we've already seen emergency rooms in Roblin and Ericsdale that had to close due to lack of available lab services. When will this PC government do the right thing for recruitment and retention and provide, provide allied health professionals, including lab technologists, with the stability and certainty of a wage settlement? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, Madam Speaker, I know the member for Union Station don't want Manitobans to know about the great work that we are doing here on this side of the House and in government, but I'm going to continue to make Manitobans aware. 80 new physician training seats, including 10 international graduate seats, $123 million in incentives to attract and retain nurses, extending the coverage of insulin pumps and continuous glucose monitors to Manitobans, adding Trikafta to the provincial drug formulary, nearly $8 billion total for health care funding, Madam Speaker, $812 million for the Clinical Preventative Services Plan. We are responding to the needs of Manitobans. We are not doing it through smoke and mirrors like the members opposite. Hey. The Honourable Member for St. James. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's clear the PC government is working for their own self-interest, not the interests of Manitobans. Nothing makes this more clear than the over one million they've budgeted for self-promoting advertising this year. At the same time, the PCs continue to cut the services Manitobans rely on. My question for the Premier is simple. Why is she spending taxpayer dollars on advertising that should be used to support services Manitobans rely on, like health care and education? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Well, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. It's too bad the uh, member opposite wouldn't have done his homework before he brought that question to oh. the chamber. Uh, Madam Speaker, I went back and looked at what the NDP spent in uh, the two previous elections, uh, back in 2016, 2011, and I found out, Madam Speaker, we put those dollars in today's dollars, the NDP has, will have spent 68% more than what we have budgeted this year. Oh. The Honourable Member for St. James on a supplementary question. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Sadly, Manitobans cannot trust math done by this PC Finance Minister. <laughs> Rather than sending much needed dollars to our health care education system, the PCs have instead budgeted over $1 million for advertising. Over $210,000 has already been spent promoting the PCs' failed budget, and $127,000 for their vote buying checks. That's hundreds of thousands of taxpayer dollars the PCs are spending in a desperate attempt to reverse opinion polls. Can the Premier explain why is she wasting taxpayer dollars for her own political gain? Good job. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Well, well, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Let's go back to the previous election. This was uh, just after the uh, NDP raised the uh, uh, previous uh, uh, provincial sales tax by uh, up to 8 uh, percent, Madam De Deputy Speaker. What, what did the NDP spend at that point in what? time? $16.5 million to tell oh. Manitobans it's okay. We took more money out of your pockets. <laughs> The Honourable Member for St. James on a final supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. As the PC spent over a million dollars on shameless, self-promoting advertising, Manitobans continue to wait for a government that will adequately invest in health care and education and more. Instead, what they get from this PC government is cuts and more cuts. Manitobans deserve a government that acts in their best interests, and one, I might add, that they can actually trust. Can the Premier explain to Manitobans why is her PC government more focused on re-election than they are on improving the services Manitobans rely on? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Well, Madam Speaker, let's talk about trust. Back in 2016, of course, uh, at the time, the Premier said, listen, we are not going to raise the provincial sales tax. Oh. What did they do? What? They raised, raised the provincial the sales tax. Oh. Then, oh. Madam Speaker, they went out and spent $16 million telling Manitobans <laughs> it was a good thing. Madam Speaker, what we did this year, we're giving carbon tax rebates to Manitobans. $225 for individuals, $375 for couples, $200 million in total. Madam Speaker, we are going to spend a million dollars to make sure that Manitobans get every nickel they deserve. The Honourable Member for St. John's. In 2019, Michael Kowalson, a former senior staffer to Brian Pallister, broke the law when he took a paid job on a federal conservative campaign while he was working in the Premier's office. That's double dipping, Madam Speaker. 
Brian Pallister was forced to apologize and told Manitobans that he directed his buddy to pay back those, ca those monies to taxpayers. End of story. So we thought. It turns out that the salary was never paid back, Madam Speaker. Oh. Government documents, which I table, show no record of it. So can the Premier say once and for all, did he pay back the money that's owed to taxpayers? The Honourable Minister of Justice. I accept nothing of the premise of which the member is putting forward because that individual has put forward lots of false allegations Absolutely. in this House before that have been proven to be false by the conflict of interest officer. The very conflict of interest officer who this opposition disparages by killing legislation that that conflict of interest officer yep. asked for. Yep. Well, they don't trust the conflict of interest officer, Madam Speaker. I will take the word over the conflict of interest officer over any member of the opposition, Madam Speaker. Yeah. Uh, the Honourable Member for St. John's on a supplementary question. Double dipping is a, against the law, Manito uh, Madam Speaker. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. Walson made $140,000 of salary while he was working in the Premier's office while doing conservative election work. That is wrong, Madam Speaker. Mm -hmm. Brian Pallister told the public that he directed his buddy to pay that, mu that money back. The Deputy Premier said it happened, yet official documents, which I table again, can't confirm it. Will the Premier say how much of that money was paid back to taxpayers? The Honourable Minister of Justice. The member seems to be walking back uh, her allegation in her second uh, question, but what can't be walked back is the fact that the opposition killed legislation asked for by the conflict of interest officer. That legislation would have required MLAs to disclose publicly on the internet gifts that they received from, uh, from uh, individuals over a certain value. Well, remember when the NDP took free jets tickets from Crown Corporations and then didn't disclose it. Maybe that is why the NDP killed legislation by the conflict of interest officer that would require gifts to be disclosed. How many more free gifts are they planning to take if the public would bring them back into government, which we won't allow to happen? <laughs> The Honourable Member for St. John's on the yeah. final supplementary. So what Michael Coulson did was wrong, and it's against the law. Yeah. The, de the Deputy Premier agreed when he said, and I quote, it was a mistake and it shouldn't have happened, end quote. So why can't the Premier say how much of his salary was paid back to Manitoba taxpayers? Government documents show that from August 2019 to July 2020, there are no records of him paying back that money to the Minister of Finance. So, will the Premier tell the House how much money did Kowalison pay back? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Uh, in uh, October uh, late last year, that very member who asked this question made allegations uh, about the member for Fort White regarding conflict of interest uh, allegations. Um, she went into uh, the hallway and repeated those allegations. They were investigated by the conflict of interest officer and found to be bogus, found to be scurrilous, found to be wrong, Madam Speaker. I will table with the permission of the member for Fort White the uh, ruling by the conflict of interest officer who says that those allegations that were made by the member opposite were wrong. This is her opportunity to apologize and stop making false allegations, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Transcona. Oh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, yesterday, Manitobans had the opportunity to come to the Manitoba Legislature and share their views on a PC government's legislative proposals, including Bill 35. We heard from dozens of presenters, many of whom were teachers, regarding their concerns with this PC education minister and his plans to subject them 
to a new disciplinary process. Everyone should have had a voice in how our kids are educated, and we should absolutely be listening to the expertise of teachers in the classroom. Having listened to the many voices of teachers last night, will the minister now agree that his government's need to work with teachers rather than imposing new processes on without consultation? Yeah, great question. The Honourable Minister of Education and Early Childhood Learning. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. And actually, I was waiting for the member from Transcona to stand up and apologize for misleading Manitobans about the signage that he goes around walking the streets of Winnipeg uh, wearing, Madam Speaker. But obviously, we're talking about something else today. So, Madam Speaker, I am going to take this opportunity to thank all those people that came last night to committee to uh, demonstrate their democratic right right here in Manitoba, to come to committee and uh, and be able to share their views and comments to Bill 35, which is a bill that is set up to, uh, to make sure that uh, we're keeping kids safe. We're talking about teachers' misconduct and also competency, Madam Speaker. So I look forward to hearing many more presenters uh, later tonight and, and possibly into tomorrow evening. The Honourable Member for Transcona on a supplementary question. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. These teachers were indeed passionate last night and advocating for their profession. Yeah. And they decried the lack of support from this government for the work that they've been doing every single day. Last night, from among many presenters, we heard several sharing their dismay, Madam Speaker, at the state of education in our province under this PC government. They decried the lack of support, the funding cuts that they have been subjected to due to this PC government's ongoing and persistent underfunding over these past seven years. So my question for the minister is this, having listened to teachers last night, will he hear their concerns and make amendments to this Bill 35? Yeah, The Honourable Minister of Education and Early Childhood Learning. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. And, and once again, main focus of Bill 35, Madam Speaker, is student safety. Protecting students in this great province of ours, Madam Speaker. Again, I actually thought the member from Transcona was going to turn a leaf and, and maybe take some self-serving comments uh, away from his uh, leader of the opposition, who seems to stand in this house on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, pretending to be some kind of actor. He's no Adam Beach, Madam Speaker. <laughs> this, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, last night we had many presenters come forward from, uh, from various education stakeholders. And once again, Madam Speaker, it's showing that myself and the department are listening to education partners right here the in Madam time has expired. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Transcona on a final supplementary. Thank, thank you, Madam Speaker. We know this PC government has consistently starved our education system of needed funding these past seven years. That is without a doubt and on the record. Teachers are on the front lines of our system, working with kids in the classroom and with families in our communities each and every day. And yet schools across the province have been grappling with budgetary constraints for years under this PC government, which has forced them to cut and trim vital programs, Madam Speaker. Given their failures to engage with educators, including their failed and unsuccessful Bill 64, is this minister willing today to amend this bill to address the concerns that he heard last night and will continue to hear tonight the and tomorrow? The member's time has yeah. expired. The Honourable Minister of Education and Early Childhood Learning. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. And and once again, it was a little difficult uh, hearing the member's uh, question because his own leader was heckling him uh, during his own question, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, so when the member opposite from Transcona talked about funding in this great province of ours, Madam Speaker, I would like to state that here in the city of Winnipeg, Louis Riel School Division for this upcoming school division is receiving $8 million increase. Pemina Trail School Division is receiving a $10 million increase. River East Transcona School Division which the member used to teach for, 
$11 million increase. St. James Assiniboia, $3.7 million increase. Seven Oaks, $3.3 million. Well, that's before, of course, they forego $4 million. Winnipeg School Division, $12.5 million increase. Madam Member Speaker, Simon's we're funding expired. it. The Honourable Member for St. Boniface. Thank you, Madam Speaker. There's a chronic issue in Manitoba where people are being denied health care and other basic services because the government isn't able to process birth certificates or health cards on time. The government has claimed that the wait list was 99% solved with only 43 people in the backlog, but this document, obtained through Freedom of Information that I table, shows that the department just redefined what a late list wait list was and put 1,949 birth, death and marriage certificates in a new category, waiting for info. Can the Premier explain the massive discrepancy between what her government was saying and what it is doing? The Honourable Minister of Consumer Protection and Government Services. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, let me begin by saying uh, how grateful I am for the hard work of our civil service, and that includes the, the folks over at uh, Vital Statistics and the, the work that they're doing uh, there to catch up on the, the backlog of uh, birth, marriage, and uh, death certificates that we had coming out of, of the pandemic. Um, we have, as uh, indicated by the Premier yesterday, added a significant number of staff there, including a number of staff in the birth registration unit, which is one of the uh, areas of uh, most significant concern. Um, I'm already seeing on uh, weekly reporting that, uh, that the pace of uh, uh, birth certificate registrations is accelerated, and I'm holding them accountable to clear the backlog entirely. Here, Thank here, you. Here, here. The Honourable Member for St. Boniface on a supplementary question. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I was at the Public Accounts Committee when these claims were repeated because Vital Statistics has had a, been a problem that was so bad the Auditor General did a report on it. We never got an explanation of how the department went off the rails because there was clearly a time in Manitoba when Vital Statistics was functioning and they were able to get these forms out on time, but it all broke down. Not only were nearly 2,000 people not being counted as part of the backlog, if they didn't get their application corrected in 30 days, the file was closed and the application was just thrown out. So how much of the backlog was reduced by this government just throwing out applications? The Honourable Minister of Consumer Protection and Government Services. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I find the, uh, the line of questioning that is being taken by the member opposite to be uh, unhelpful, I think, to the overall discussion. Uh, we do ensure and we, we, uh, we do our best to, uh, to improve the processes. We've engaged with also our, our digital technical services team to find ways to improve the processes. We've directed more and more individuals to use an online form so that we have less errors occurring uh, due to handwriting. What the member opposite is trying to, uh, uh, trying to bring forward in this House is not helpful. The Honourable Member for Tyndall Park on a final supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Earlier today, I tabled a list of ideas that come directly from seniors in Tyndall Park. Now that the Minister has had an opportunity to review the ideas, will he agree to meet with a few of my constituents over the next month? The um, Honourable Minister of Justice. Uh, we appreciate the fact that this particular member often brings forward uh, ideas and questions uh, from her constituents. Sometimes there are students who come here to the gallery and, and watch her pose those questions. In this case, there are obviously questions from seniors, which she's posed to the Minister of Seniors, who's a great advocate on behalf of seniors, and I'm sure that the Minister of Seniors will respond uh, directly to the member on the questions that she has tabled. The Honourable Member for Borderland. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Over the last five years, Candace House has been an integral support for families and survivors of violent crime. When people are at their most vulnerable, these staff and volunteers stand with them every step of the way. Our government uh, supports Candace House and the amazing people that provide these wraparound services. And I understand that the Minister of Justice recently made an announcement of additional supports. Can he explain to this House exactly how this will further help Manitobans who are impacted by violent crime? The Honourable Minister of Justice. I'd like to thank my friend from Borderland for that uh, question uh, and congratulate him on the uh, new member of the family who was a recent. Uh, many, um, many Manitobans will remember the tragic story of Candace Dirksen and the heroic efforts of uh, Wilma and Cliff Dirksen in looking to start up a place where victims' uh, families could go to outside the courtroom for support. Uh, that resulted in 2018 of the opening of Candace House, 
uh, close to the courthouse where individuals were going through a trial process uh, where there was a murder involved could go and get support. Last week we provided an additional $200,000 to Candace House so it can be expanded so the great work can continue to be done and victims can be supported. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The government's approach to Manitoba parks doesn't make any sense. We should be encouraging more Manitobans to get out and use our parks. Instead, this government is making them unaffordable for everyday Manitobans. We received a FIPA, which I'll table, which makes clear, or at least more clear, what the plan for the parks is by this PC government. They want to raise fees. Can the minister tell us how much he's planning to raise park fees? The Honourable Minister for Natural Resources and Northern Development. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, the member across the aisle is just wrong. Uh, our park system is a treasure here in Manitoba. We recently went through a parks reservation system overhaul. Great comments on the reservation system. Many more sites booked at Manitoba. No increases, no increases planned. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon on a supplementary question. Madam Speaker, the PCs did make their plan quite clear in the, in the FIPA documents that we tabled. Order. They've contracted out and privatized services. Now they're planning on hiking park fees. They've considered hiking fees for yurts by $38 a night, camp cabins $44, seasonal rentals a whopping $1,047. That's just plain wrong. Will the minister be up front and tell us just how much he plans to hike park fees come going forward? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources and Northern Development. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, the member across the floor is totally wrong. Total fabrication. That doesn't exist. What does exist is that the NDP's policies failed provincial parks. You know, we know provincial parks are a valued park of Manitoba, and we intend to keep them in the public system here in Manitoba. Parks aren't for sale, as the members always like to talk about. We, we will continue to improve parks. Budget 2023 earmarks $220 million over the next 10 years for parks. And I urge the members on the other side to please stay tuned for a great announcement in May on how we're going to spend that money on parks all across this great province of Manitoba. Yay! Time for oral questions has expired, and we do have some guests in the gallery that I would like to introduce to you. We have seated in the public gallery from Neelan High School, 30 grade nine students under the direction of Carrie Malazdrich, and this group is located in the constituency of the Honourable Member for Brandon East. On behalf of all Honourable Members here, we welcome you to the Manitoba Legislature. Petitions of the Honourable Member for Transcona. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I wish to present the following petition to the Legislative Assembly. To the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba, the background of this petition is as follows. Number one, according to Census 2021, Punjabi is the fourth most spoken language in Canada. Order! And there are 33,315 people in Manitoba whose native language is Punjabi. Number two, thousands of Punjabi newcomers are coming to Manitoba as students and as immigrants looking to call this province home. People of Punjabi origin contribute a great deal to the social and economic development of Canada and Manitoba in fields such as education, science, health, business, and politics. Number three, in coming to Manitoba, Punjabi newcomers make sacrifices including distance from their cultural roots and language. Many Punjabi parents and families want their children to retain their language and keep a continued cultural appreciation. Number four, 
Manitoba has many good bilingual programs and public schools for children and teens available in other languages, including French, Ukrainian, Ojibwe, Filipino, Cree, Hebrew, and Spanish. Punjabi bilingual programs for children and teens, as well as Punjabi language instruction at a college and university level, could similarly teach and maintain Punjabi language and culture. Number five. Punjabi bilingual instruction will help cross cultural friendships, relationships, and marriages and prepare young people to be multilingual professionals. We therefore petition the Legislative Assembly Manitoba as follows to urge the provincial government to take steps to implement Punjabi bilingual programs in public schools similar to existing bilingual programs and take steps to implement Punjabi language instruction in other levels of education in Manitoba. This petition, Madam Speaker, is signed by Prabjot Kaur, Ashpreet Kaur, Ramanjot Kaur, and many other Manitobans. In accordance with our Rule 133 bracket 6, when petitions are read, they are deemed to be received by the House. The Honourable Member for Elmwood. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I wish to present the following petition to the Legislative Assembly. The background of this petition Order. is as follows. Number one. Over 25,000 vehicles per day cross the Louise Bridge, which has served as a vital link for vehicular traffic between Northeast Winnipeg and the downtown for the last 112 years. Number two, the current structure will undoubtedly be declared unsafe in a few years as it's deteriorated extensively and is now functionally obsolete, therefore must be subject to more frequent unplanned repairs, cannot be widened to accommodate future traffic capacity. Number three, as far back as 2008, the City of Winnipeg has studied where the new replacement bridge should be situated. Number four, after including the bridge replacement in the City's five-year capital budget forecast in 2009, the new bridge became a short-term construction priority in the City's transportation master plan of 2011. Number five, City capital and budget plans identified replacement of the Louise Bridge on a site just east of the bridge and expropriated homes there on the south side of Naren Avenue in anticipation of a 2015 start. In 2014, the new city administration did not make use of available federal infrastructure funds. Number seven, the new Louise Bridge Committee began its campaign to demand a new bridge and its surveys confirmed the residents wanted a new bridge beside the current bridge. The old bridge kept open for local traffic. Number eight, the NDP provincial government signaled its firm commitment to partner with the city on replacing the Louise Bridge in its 2015 throne speech. Unfortunately, provincial infrastructure initiatives such as the new Louise Bridge came to a halt with the election of the Progressive Conservative government in 2016. Number nine, more recently, the city tethered the Louise Bridge replacement issue to the new transportation master plan and Eastern Corridor project. Its recommendations have now identified the location of the new Louise Bridge to be placed just to the west of the current bridge, not to the east as originally proposed. Number 10, the city expropriation process has begun. The $6.35 million street upgrade of Naren Avenue from Watt Street to the 112-year-old bridge is complete. Number 11. The new city administration has delayed the decision on the Louise Bridge for a minimum of one year and possibly up to 10 years unless the province steps in on behalf of Northeast Winnipeg residents and completes this overdue link. Number 12. The Premier has a duty to direct the provincial government to provide financial assistance to the city so it can complete this long overdue and vital link to Northeast Winnipeg and Transcona. We petition the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba as follows. Number one to urge the Premier to financially assist the City of Winnipeg on building this three-lane bridge in each direction to maintain this vital link between Northeast Winnipeg, Transcona, and the downtown. Number two, to urge the provincial government to recommend that the City of Winnipeg keep the old bridge fully open to traffic while the new bridge is under construction. And number three, 
to urge the provincial government to consider the feasibility of keeping the old bridge open for active transportation in the future. And this petition is signed by many, many Manitobans. The Honourable Member for Point Douglas. Thank you, which, Madam Speaker, I wish to present the following petition to the Legislative Assembly. The background to this petition is as follows. One, the population of those age 55 plus has grown to approximately 2,500 in the city of Thompson. Two, a large percentage of people in this age group require necessary medical foot care and treatment. Three, a large percentage of those who are elderly and or diabetic are living on low incomes. Four, the Northern Regional Health Authority previously provided essential medical foot care services to seniors and those living with diabetes until 2019, then subsequently cut the program after the last two nurse filling those positions retired. Five, the number of seniors and those with diabetes has only continued to grow in Thompson and surrounding areas. Six, there is no adequate medical care available in the city and region, whereas the city of Winnipeg has 14 medical foot care centres. Seven, the implications of inadequate or lack of podiatric care can lead to amputations. Eight, the City of Thompson also serves as a regional health care service provider, and the need for foot care extends beyond just those served in the capital city of the province. We petition the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba as follows, to urge the provincial government to provide the services of two nurses to restore essential medical foot care treatment to the City of Thompson, effective April 1, 2022. And this has been signed by many, many Manitobans. Grievances, orders of the day, government business, the Honourable Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. First on a matter of House business, pursuant to Rule 34, bracket 7, I'm announcing that the private member's resolution to be considered on the next Tuesday of private member's business will be the one previously put forward by the Honourable Member for Dauphin. The title of that resolution is calling on the federal government to absorb the cost of increased RCMP salaries. It has been announced that the private member's resolution to be considered on the next Tuesday of private member's business will be one previously put forward by the Honourable Member for Dauphin. The title of the resolution is calling on the federal government to absorb the cost of increased RCMP salaries. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Could you please resolve the House into Committee of Supply? It has been announced that the House will consider estimates this afternoon. The House will now resolve into Committee of Supply. Mr. Deputy Speaker, please take the chair.
Okay. Good afternoon. Will the Committee of Supply please come to order? We are resuming consideration of the estimates for the Department of Advanced Education and Training. When we last met, we had just started the process of putting the question on resolutions. Uh, from what I understand, the Minister will not be having her staff enter the chamber, nor will the official opposition have their staff enter the chamber. So we shall now resume with consideration of the resolutions. Resolution 44.3, resolved that there be granted to His Majesty a sum not exceeding $77,581,000 for advanced education and training, student access and success for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2024. Shall the resolution pass? The resolution is accordingly passed. Resolution 44.4, resolved that there be granted to His Majesty a sum not exceeding $80 million for advanced education and training, loans and guarantees programs for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2024. Shall the resolution pass? The resolution is accordingly passed. Resolution 44.5, resolve that there be granted to His Majesty a sum not exceeding $35,995,000 for advanced education and training, other reporting ent entities, capital investment for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2024. Shall the resolution pass? The resolution is accordingly passed. The last item to be considered for the estimates of this department is item 44.1A, the minister's salary contained in resolution 44.1. The floor is open for questions. No questions? No questions. Okay. Resolution 44.1, resolve that there be granted to his majesty a sum ex a not exceeding $3,163,000 for advanced education and training administration for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2024. Shall the resolution pass? The resolution is accordingly passed. This completes the estimates for the Department of Advanced Education and Training. The next set of estimates to, cons to be considered by this section of the Committee of Supply will be for the Department of Justice. Shall we briefly recess to allow the Minister and Critics the opportunity to prepare for the comm commencement of the next department? Okay. We are in recess.
Will the Committee of Supply please come to order? This section of the Committee of Supply will now consider the estimates of the Department of Justice. Does the Honorable Minister have an opening statement? The Honourable Minister. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairperson. I do have an opening uh, statement. I want to um, begin by, uh, again, thanking all the staff in the Department of Justice. And um, I did that, actually, even when I was the critic of, uh, for justice for a long time in opposition. I'm sure that my friend from Concordia would echo uh, thanks for the departmental uh, staff, who, of course, are above and beyond the political fray um, that we often get into. Uh, I, I want to also uh, make mention that today, uh, this morning, I had the opportunity to speak to um, the National Police Leadership Conference that is beginning in Winnipeg uh, this morning and I think is uh, taking place over a couple of days. So chiefs of police and other law enforcement leadership from across the country and, and a few from the United States, I understand as well, um, have gathered uh, in Winnipeg and, and just maybe to echo some of the comments that I made this morning uh, to that group. Um, you know, it's a, it's a challenging time uh, in society generally, I would say, but, but in policing in particular. Um, lots of discussion, of course, about an increase of, of violent crime that we've seen uh, in Canada and North America, and it might be across, you know, in the world too. I haven't done sort of a, an international uh, look other than into the United States. But um, lots of concern about, about that from the public, and of course that reflects on the work of, of police officers and the challenges that they have. Uh, the member for Concordia has, has made mention, along with others in the House, about the police officer deaths that we've seen um, more dramatically in Canada in the last few months than we've seen in, in many, many years. And the concern about um, the violence that, that police are, are facing as well over the last while. And, and I shared those comments at the um, National Police Leadership Conference this morning, but, but also then expressed that it is my belief that um, the vast majority of Canadians you know, stand with our uh, law enforcement officials, women and men in law enforcement, knowing that they're doing a difficult uh, job. Uh, I know that sometimes uh, the critics' voices, uh, and I'm not referring to the member for Concordia, I'm talking about critics more generally, uh, of policing, uh, often their voices are, are heard more, more strongly, but I, I really believe that the majority of, of Canadians uh, support the work and understand the difficulty of policing. Uh, and that's not just from a perspective of, of uh, those officers who've lost their lives, although of course it, it is from that perspective as well, but also remembering that you know, the mental health toll that it takes on officers and um, the PTSD that I think many officers face from the kinds of things that they see uh, almost on a daily basis in some, uh, some ways that they take home to their families as well. Uh, we need to remember that because that's not, it's not an invisible thing, but it isn't as visible uh, for, for many. We have to recognize that many officers, you know, suffer the weight of, um, of that as well. So I wanted to you know, simply start with that and, and recognize the conference that's happening this morning uh, and over the next uh, couple of days and the officers uh, who, are, who are there. Uh, I also want to acknowledge you know, the, the fact that Manitoba, I think, has taken a leadership role on a lot of different uh, parts of the justice file. Um, I, I, I cite in particular the need for bail reform, which Manitoba started to you know, advocate for last summer, so uh, more than a year ago. And, and to talk about it not just in the broader context of bail reform, but more specifically with the challenges that are happening in our province as it relates to violent acts that uh, use bladed weapons, edged weapons, uh, and bear spray, which isn't um, foreign to, to, to provinces like Saskatchewan. Provinces like Saskatchewan would also say that they have challenges with, um, with the use of bear spray, um, but it's not common in every province. And so we wanted to make sure that when we were talking to the federal government about potential criminal code changes that we, that we spoke about the Manitoba context, even though every province is dealing with an increase in violence, uh, it doesn't manifest itself the same way in, in every province. So we were pleased um, coming out of a discussion that we had 
with other uh, attorney generals and the federal minister of justice and the federal minister of public safety, uh, Mr. Lametti and Mr. Mendicino respectively, to be able to get um, a commitment for another meeting, so this happened in Halifax of, uh, in fall of last year, and then the follow-up meeting was March 10th in Ottawa um, of this year, and we did get a commitment for significant uh, bail reform. Now, I, I hasten to add that we haven't actually seen those changes. We haven't seen the text uh, or the bill that would change the criminal code, uh, which resulted, I believe, in, in a meeting between the premiers uh, across the country and chiefs of police uh, who are advocating for that bail reform and uh, a renewed call to see that bail reform brought to the House of Commons so that it can be voted upon and hopefully enacted in relatively short order because it's, it's no small thing in terms of the number of individuals that we're seeing who are being uh, released on bail who, who shouldn't be released, I would say, um, but then also who ultimately are found to be involved in another criminal act. And I think that all members, including my friend from Concordia, would acknowledge you know, the frustration that um, victims would have. I mean, it's frustrating you know, in and of itself to, have, uh, to be a victim of crime, but I, I think it's uh, particularly frustrating when you find out that the individual who's accused of that crime um, was out on bail accused of another crime. And, uh, and, and so we, we need to ensure that um, maybe the unintended consequences of changes to federal legislation in 2019 um, are, um, are, are changed again. Now, I know that not every member of the House feels the same way. Uh, my friend uh, from Concordia, his friend, uh, the member for Fort Gary, uh, has publicly said that he feels differently. He doesn't feel that there needs to be uh, bail reform. He's spoken out against the uh, chiefs of police call in Canada. He's spoken out against um, other premiers in Canada, including the NDP premier in British Columbia, who has asked for um, bail reform. And so uh, we know that it's not a uniform position about, about bail uh, reform, that not everybody in the NDP feels that that uh, is important, and maybe not even the majority of their members feel that it's important. Um, but I think the member for Fort Gary sometimes says publicly what other NDP members just think privately. So, you know, we'll have that debate, I suppose, over the, the several days or, or weeks or however long we're going to be in estimates with um, my, uh, my friend from, from Concordia. And I think it's a healthy debate to have because uh, it's top of mind and people are, are concerned. Clearly something has changed over the last couple of years. I'm sure that the member for Concordia will, will try to paint this as a, as a Manitoba problem, but he'll know, and I think Manitobans know, that, that you know, this has become uh, at least a North America concern and maybe a global concern probably in terms of uh, the increase of crime um, coming out of the last uh, couple of years. And, and then we'll talk, I'm sure, about strategies to, uh, to address that. One of the strategies I hope that we are able to talk about is the uh, more than $50 million commitment to a violent crime strategy in the province of Manitoba, which um, is part of this estimates process and part of the budgetary process and that involves a number of different initiatives, many of which have been announced already and others which will be uh, announced uh, in time. And, and I, I want to thank in particular uh, the Winnipeg Police Service and Chief Danny Smythe and um, the, uh, the RCMP in Manitoba and Commissioner Rob Hill for their cooperation and their ideas in terms of you know, the things that we can do to address these, uh, these concerns that are happening across the province. And, and you've seen the outcome of that in terms of integrated units that have been announced. Uh, and the integration of those units is important because we know that that uh, criminals aren't operating in, on boundaries. They're not, they're not necessarily bound by the city of Winnipeg or bound by rural communities, um, that they are moving freely, not only between uh, borders within our province, but, but moving freely within borders or between borders throughout, throughout our country. Uh, and so the cooperation between the Winnipeg Police Service and the RCMP and you know, the Brandon Police Service and other municipal forces um, has really been heartening. Um, because it, it's something that um, I know that the previous ministers of justice in this role, my predecessors, uh, have talked about, but have also of action through things like the MCIC, the Manitoba Criminal Intelligence Center, which the member 
uh, may want to uh, query about as we go through uh, this process. And so we, um, we very much look forward to uh, the estimates over the next days and weeks uh, and uh, having the opportunity to, to speak about the good work that's happening in Manitoba justice, but also the challenges that exist within, within the province and the country. There's not a, a magic solution, but we all do better when we work towards uh, uh, a solution. The Honourable Minister's time has expired. We thank the minister for those comments. Does the official opposition, does the official opposition critic, have any opening comments? Did you not see my hand? I... No, no, I didn't actually. Sorry, that's very maybe. I was, um, the clerk was. Um, yes, the uh, honourable member for Concordia. Please thank go you. ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Appreciate uh, your indulgence and. Uh, uh, in your uh, role as, uh, as chair of this uh, committee hearing. Uh, this is an, an important uh, committee hearing and this is an important uh, opportunity uh, for us to, uh, to get some answers and get some more information from the minister with regards to the uh, department and uh, delve a little bit deeper into some of the, um, uh, some of the statements that he made in his opening comments uh, as well as other uh, commitments that the government has made. So we look forward to a productive process here um, this afternoon. Uh, but it's also an important process because we are spending some time talking about public safety. And uh, public safety is a, an absolutely foundational part of uh, our healthy communities, uh, of a healthy city, a healthy communities across our province, and of a healthy province. Um, you know, I did spend some time uh, doing some community organizing before I was elected, and uh, just in my own neighborhood, uh, a community that often uh, was painted with a, a broad brush, and uh, people would talk about uh, the community of Elmwood, in this case, as being an unsafe neighborhood. And what we found was that that was, uh, that was the feeling amongst residents, that they didn't feel safe in their community, that they didn't feel that they were able to, uh, uh, to live freely in their community. And that really impacted almost every other aspect of the, the organizing and, and ways we were trying to make our community better. And, uh, and I know this from my own personal life because, uh, you know, I've got kids, uh, my parents live in, in the neighborhood, and, uh, and of course, as the MLA for Concordia, we hear this all the time, that people are concerned about uh, crime and safety in their community. And, and again, if you don't feel safe, uh, you're not going to, uh, to be able to uh, be a, a productive and, and uh, a good community, as good a community as you'd like. This is also an important topic because, of course, we, uh, we ask uh, law enforcement to, uh, to, to go out every day and uh, serve and protect us, and uh, that is uh, no easy task. Um, again, I'm speaking from some personal experience. I have a close family member who uh, is a member of the Winnipeg Police Service and uh, tells me on a regular basis about some of the difficult calls uh, that he has to attend to, and I know some have made it into the media. In fact, uh, uh, his picture was just in the paper the other day um, uh, as part of a, uh, an investigation that many uh, in people in the province would, uh, would recognize, uh, and a difficult one. And um, when he tells me these stories, when he gives me some context and some insight into his day-to-day, uh, it, it gives me an appreciation, a further appreciation for the work that law enforcement does across our, our province. And I believe that it is incumbent on us as legislators to, uh, to have their backs, to have our, uh, our law enforcement's backs when uh, they're out there risking their lives for us, that we're going to take their work seriously and that we're going to uh, stay away from the political rhetoric, that we're going to get down to uh, the important work that, that we can do to support them. And, uh, and I think that's part of what this process here uh, this afternoon can do. So I'm looking forward to getting into that. I also think it's important because we are, of course, in an election year. And uh, as I mentioned, that political rhetoric is certainly ramping up. Um, you know, we uh, in fact had a budget this year that uh, many would argue is uh, simply a political uh, document. 
very few uh, realities or facts or figures or certainly no uh, acknowledgement by the government of the harms that they have perpetrated over the last seven years that have led to our current situation. And uh, I, it is very concerning to me uh, because, you know, as I've said many times in this House and publicly, the cuts that this PC government has brought uh, uh, across the board, whether it be health, education, uh, housing, poverty, uh, the list goes on and on and on, addictions and mental health supports, those cuts have consequences. And one of the consequences of those cuts is that we uh, are now facing some of the, the worst outcomes in uh, uh, public safety and, and uh, crime across our province. It's not just in the city of Winnipeg, uh, although certainly uh, I know we've heard a lot from people in the suburbs of Winnipeg, downtown. It's also other cities. It's cities across our, our province. And, you know, sadly, it's actually small communities, it's towns. And it's a lot of places in our province who are saying this government has failed us. They've failed us fundamentally when it comes to, as I said, health, education, uh, poverty reductions, addictions. They have failed us and they've failed our citizens and now we are suffering the consequences. Now we, as small communities or the city of Winnipeg, are dealing with this government's uh, cuts and the consequences of those cuts. So. I think it's important to put in context the overall picture and, and, and I guess the posture that we see from this government uh, in an election year where they're saying, oh, well, you know, d just forget about everything we've done over the last seven years. Uh, forget about Brian Pallister's cuts. Forget about this current premier's cuts, uh, you know, as, uh, well, as justice minister, uh, certainly, and, and we can get into some of those cuts, but as health minister, and now as Premier, just, just forget about all those cuts for seven years, all the impacts that those cuts have had in our communities, and trust this new version of us that we're going to present that has no resemblance of, of who we've been. And, you know, Manitobans are smarter than that. They really are. And so uh, I hope that we can stay out of that kind of rhetoric. We can stay out of that kind of, uh, you know, p uh, political election year uh, uh, you know, grandiose statements, and we can stick to the facts because what we're seeing here, um, what we have in terms of the estimates before us, uh, is a clear indication of this government's priorities, and they certainly aren't uh, the priorities that promote public safety and promote um, uh, promote uh, justice broadly in our province. So I uh, I think that uh, you know I do hope that we'll I do have a number of questions just to kind of set that out at the outset. I know the minister can sometimes um, you know not be the most uh, concise. I, I also know that I can I just say that I also know that the minister can be incredibly concise because we've also seen that version of the minister in the past. So I do hope that we see the latter rather than the former because, uh, because I do have a number of questions uh, that I'd like to get through today. I, uh, I do hope we get some factual answers and that we uh, you know, ultimately answer the question uh, to Manitobans that you know, how can we get out of this mess that the, the PC government has put us in. And uh, I hope that the minister will lay out his, his uh, vision and his plan and then say, just trust us. And uh, I look forward to uh, you know, getting some answers so that we can present the kind of plan that Manitobans want to hear, one of uh, hope and one of uh, positive solutions that has been sorely lacking from a government that has simply cut at every turn and made things worse uh, in uh, so many ways, but uh, in this case, in uh, crime and safety. So I look forward to the conversation here this uh, afternoon, and uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to the Minister. Uh, we thank the critic from the official opposition for those remarks. Under Manitoba practice, debate on the Minister's salary is the last item considered for a department. Accordingly, we shall now defer consideration of line item 4.1a contained in resolution 4.1. At this time, um, At this time, we invite ministerial and opposition staff to enter the chamber, and I would ask the minister and critic to please introduce their staff in attendance.
So if the minister uh, could introduce his staff, uh, we'll go into questions after. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. It's my uh, pleasure and honour to introduce the three staff members who have joined me here in the chamber. To my immediate left is the Assistant Deputy Minister of Justice, Maria Campos, um, who is an incredibly diligent uh, individual in providing information. I'm sure she'll be incredibly supportive in this process. Uh, immediately in front of me is uh, Marty McNichol, uh, who is the Special Assistant Chief of Staff, uh, one of the most talented uh, staff people I've had the opportunity to work with over uh, 20 years and then to my uh, right he's he's a rookie maybe in terms of the deputy minister of justice but not to this building having served in a number of different roles is already proving himself to be incredible value to the department um, deputy minister Jerry Ackerstream thank you minister uh, in accordance with sub rule 7816 uh, during the consideration of departmental estimates questioning for each department shall proceed in a global manner with questions put on the resolution once the official opposition critic indicates that questioning has concluded the floor is now open for questions uh, the honorable member for concordia uh, thank you very much mr chair and thank you to staff for joining us here today um, uh, I should also potentially mention we uh, we do have uh, a virtual staff member. I guess that doesn't matter so who's in the chamber, but uh, I'll put his name on the record anyway uh, because as he's uh, as he's uh, keeping me uh, abreast of things on his end, uh, Nathan Laser is uh, doing his best to uh, to assist me here, even though he's not physically in the chamber. Um, uh, and uh, just before we begin, I just wanted to uh, put on the record uh, for the minister's uh, benefit, and I haven't had a chance to, to talk with him uh, off the record before this, but just to, so that it's on the record, uh, I do want to flag to the minister that I do uh, intend uh, tomorrow, uh, in estimates, to spend some time on MPI. Uh, and I know that that would probably be a, a different set of staff that would be uh, in attendance for that. And there may be some, uh, some more technical questions that it would be appropriate to have those staff uh, come forward for. And so uh, just giving him a heads up uh, with regards to, uh, you know, page 39 of this year's supplement to the estimates expenditure for the Manitoba Justice Department, uh, we are going to be asking some questions with regards to MPI. And, uh, you know, I, I will... Uh, you know, maybe delve into some more details at that point. But I just thought I'd give the minister an opportunity if he wanted to put anything on the record with regards to uh, to that part of the process. And uh, we look forward to uh, digging into MPI a little bit more tomorrow. The Honourable Minister. Well, yeah, and I, and I thank the, the critic for that heads up. I know um, in the past when I uh, was in his uh, position as critic, I would often indicate to uh, Minister of Justice of the day um, where we'd be going on estimates the next day so that we could align staff, so that, that's helpful. Um, however, I'd give him the same caution that former ministers of justice gave me uh, when I was in his role in that uh, MPI um, it would, would normally, the questions would come through a Crown Corporation uh, committee, any detailed questions, if there's maybe some very high level questions, we might be able to entertain it, but they don't form you know, the normal process of, of this estimates process, Crown Corporations, whether it's Hydro or Liquor or, or um, uh, MPI, uh, are generally questioned at Crown Corporations Committee, which I know the member opposite would be probably retort that uh, he'd love to see a committee called, uh, and I'm sure it will be called in the normal course, but that would be where the questions are. So I'm not trying to dampen his enthusiasm or give him any um, sense that it might not be uh, a good process tomorrow, but he might not uh, get all the details that he's looking for because it doesn't form a normal pro a part of this uh, estimate process. The member for uh, Concordia. Well, and, and I mean, it sounds like we're, uh, the minister and I are, are in agreement right off the start, so that's a, a good thing. I do think that the Crown Corporations meeting would be a great place for some of these questions to uh, uh, to be asked. Uh, and uh, so I would encourage the minister, if you'd like to put on the record right now, that he's willing to call that Crown Corporations meeting uh, immediately. And uh, let's get to those answers. And, and then I would certainly be happy to defer those questions to that that body. Uh, that being said, um, 
I expect, uh, you know, and I caught the, the minister's, uh, uh, you know, little uh, political uh, technique there to, uh, to to wiggle his way out of calling that committee uh, by indicating, you know, under the, the normal course of, of the uh, uh, of the Crown Corporation schedule. And, of course, he knows that uh, much has changed with MPI since uh, December of 2022. Uh, he knows that since December of 2022, uh, new information has come to light with regards to MPI that, uh, you know, certainly shocked Manitobans, but I would imagine uh, has, has given the minister some um, heartburn as well, so to speak, uh, because he's now uh, saying there needs to be a further process with regards to a ministerial uh, inquiry, um, and he needs to, uh, to immediately step in and take control of the the boondoggle that's happening over there uh, so I do think that the minister has some some you know some leeway here in in making sure that he's accountable this is the the process him as minister as I said on page 39 it does indicate that there is uh, departmental money going uh, to MPI that is clearly within the the purview of this committee and this estimates process so I would hope that the minister wouldn't uh, hide behind uh, this this other process that he of course isn't willing to uh, uh, to engage at this point when Manitobans are asking for it most with regards to a pu uh, public uh, Crown Corporations meeting that he would just uh, commit here today to actually answering some of those questions to make sure that we get those answers that Manitobans are certainly very very concerned about. The Honourable Minister. Uh, well, I appreciate the member uh, being concerned about my, my health. Um, you know, I um, will admit to having heartburn uh, long before MPI. Uh, Nexium is a good uh, solution to that or other uh, things that a doctor can prescribe for him. If, um, uh, if he wants to uh, go for a prescription, I can uh, suggest to him a couple of doctors who can provide that. Uh, but when it comes to um, Crown Corporations committees, he'll remember and know, I think, from when he was in government, there was a time it was almost impossible to get the former NDP government to call a Crown Corporation committee. In fact, I think, although I could be tested on this, that we had to change the rules to make it an annual sort of thing. Otherwise, you know, we could go for, you know, one, two, three years before the former government would actually call a Crown Corporation uh, committee. Some of uh, that was maybe because of things that would be revealed. I remember one in particular where I think it was Andrew Swan who was the Minister of Justice and also was responsible for MPI at the time where there was a question about a contract, a $50,000 contract that was provided to uh, I think it was Marilyn McLaren. If anyway, I don't have notes in front of me, but I think it was Marilyn McLaren. And we asked what the um, purpose of the contract was, and the the head of MPI was uh, nice enough to be uh, clear to say that there was no purpose, that there wasn't expected to be any work provided for that fifty thousand dollars. It was just to ensure that uh, that person would would answer the phone if they ever needed to uh, to call, which at that point they never did. Uh, and uh, I remember um, then former Minister Swan. Uh, turning different colors of, uh, of white, I think, and maybe he had uh, had heartburn at the time because he quickly uh, quickly left the room. So it was sometimes difficult to get the former NDP government to call Crown Corporation committees, and maybe that was one of, of the reasons. I, I don't think that the member for Concordia was ever one of the NDP MLAs appointed to uh, MPI. He'll, I, don't, I don't believe he was appointed there, but he'll remember those, those committees and um, the challenging uh, time we had getting them called, but when they were called, they were enlightening. Uh, that particular contract, the the fifty thousand dollar a year contract for nothing, was interesting. Um, you know, we learned a lot about uh, executive pay under the NDP at, at that time and different things that the uh, Crown Corporation spent money on. And maybe that was why we had a difficult time getting those meetings. But uh, because the member will remember uh, those particular Crown Corporation committees, he'll also know that there's a purpose for them, and that is because the executive and others who are there to answer questions about not just MPI, but the other crowns when they're called, um, have the expertise to, to provide that. So again, I'm not suggesting the member can't answer some questions. I'm just trying to, I'm not even trying to damper his enthusiasm or to try to quell his optimism. I'm just saying that the process by which these questions are normally asked and answered are through Crown Corporations. Um, committees, and, and that's probably where he should put most of his hope in terms of asking some of the questions that he might have. Uh, I don't think it's quite as dramatic as he lays out in terms of some of the 
uh, the challenges uh, at MPI, but I also don't want to suggest that, that there aren't challenges or challenges all the time in Crown Corporation, some of which have been 17 years in the making. But um, I can assure him as, as a government house leader, uh, and I don't know how long I'll hold that position, but I've held it for 15 years, so it doesn't seem to be leaving me very quickly, uh, or the house leader position, I've been government house leader for 15 years, uh, that I will call the Crown Corporation Committee and the statutory uh, requirement uh, that is that is required. So that will be prior to the end of this year. The honorable member was the for leader. Concordia. <laughs> the glorious time of uh, Andrew Micklefield as house leader is quickly forgotten. Oh, my apologies to the clerk and to the, to the committee. Uh, <laughs> But I do take the, the member's point, and, and, uh, and I, I'm, again, once again, in agreement, it sounds like the minister understands the value of getting answers uh, about Crown Corporations. It sounds like he uh, seemed to feel there were some frustrations when he was in uh, opposition and getting answers. Um, so I'm sure he will undertake to, uh, to get those answers for the committee. And in one place, I would disagree with the minister when he says uh, he's he's continues to downplay and to over two hundred million dollar budget overage, and uh, he he says that's not dramatic. Uh, well, I think most Manitobans would consider two hundred million dollars of their uh, their money being wasted by the PC government as uh, being quite dramatic. At least I certainly do. Maybe just to close off this section, because I do have questions with regards to justice, uh, I just want to uh, get on the record, if the minister could be quite clear about this, uh, is he then committing to bring his MPI staff to, uh, to this committee tomorrow so that we can get some factual answers to the questions that we have with regards to MPI? The Honourable Minister of Justice. So I have to take some umbrage with the, the member's um, characterization of of you know how I feel about you know cost overruns, uh, whether that's specifically to MPI's Project Nova, which is what he's referring to, or to other things. I take no uh, satisfaction in that. It's not the first time that there's been overruns in technology programs. I can list some under the former NDP government, um, but you know very clearly I said when asked about it is that uh, it's problematic. It's a concern. We've indicated to MPI that. Uh, there won't be any additional uh, government support provided. They've given me assurance that both A, that project is on time, and B, that they are not expecting there to be any additional um, uh, costs for the project. But I'd reiterate to the member again, because he always leaves this part out. I understand the cost, the cost concerns. I, you know, we want to ensure that MPI provides good service for Manitobans at the best price possible. So anything that deals with costs, whether it's the contracts that the NDP used to provide for no uh, work being expected, uh, or corporate compensation or executive compensation that the NDP used to authorize that was concerning, or a cost overrun on a computer program. Those are concerning. But the member leaves off the part about the importance of the program and why it is that there needs to be uh, such a significant uh, technical overhaul at MPI, and to remember that you know the, we're talking about you know new systems that are going into brokerages across the province because a lot of these services are still developed across uh, the province. We're talking about online services that haven't been available, but the customers expect, I believe, in this particular uh, time when it comes to Manitoba public insurance. So we, you know, there, it, it's a significant undertaking that yes will come with. A significant cost. There's no question about that. But it's an undertaking that was never undertaken by the NDP in the 16 or 17 years that they were in government. And we see the cost of that. I mean, the member will know, you know, the cost of the fact that they didn't upgrade the um, the emergency system for our first responders and others. You know, so that when if you were responding to a fire in Vita, uh, you know, you're working on a, a system. Um, that was so old that they had to get parts on eBay to keep it uh, running. And that, I think, was about a billion dollar touch when it came to the cost of refixing that when we came into government and realized it was, was falling apart. It's a significant amount of money, but what are the options? Not having communications between people who are dealing with emergencies, and in this particular situation with MPI, uh, not upgrading the computer system, well, the member knows what that would, what, what that would result in. 
if there was no computer system. I'm not sure if he's expecting courier pigeons to be you know, moving around uh, different claims and, and different uh, filings between, uh, between different parts of Manitoba. Of course, we need to have a modern computer system. But I'm also not uh, dismissive of the issue of costs. I've never been dismissive of the issue of costs. Uh, and I've said that uh, publicly. It is my expectation that MPI will deliver solid customer service of what Manitobans would expect at the best possible price. Uh, now, in terms of uh, MPI officials here, that would be a very unusual process um, to, have, to bring MPI or other Crown Corporation officials into a budget, a provincial budget estimates um, procedure. I'm not aware of, of, uh, of times as that's been done in the past because there is a specific process for that. The specific process is called Crown Corporations Committee. And the Crown Corporations Committee, which the member will remember from when he was in government, that they were reluctant to call, reluctant to call, um, is one where the CEO of the of the corporation, whether that's Manitoba Liquor uh, and Lotteries or Cannabis, as it's called now, uh, or MPI or Manitoba Hydro, where those individuals come in for hours at a time, answer questions. In fact. The MPI, I don't have it in front of me, but I believe that the MPI committee was in December of, of last year, so December of 2022, uh, where the member opposite or his counterparts, I don't remember who was asking the questions, would have had plenty of opportunity to, to ask questions. Now, maybe he's dissatisfied with the questions that he asked at that time, but that's not my responsibility. He's the critic. And uh, I played that role for a long time. And if you're unhappy with the questions that you asked or you're unhappy with the questions that your counterparts asked in your caucus, that, that's an internal process that you need to work out among yourselves in terms of getting better questions uh, when it comes to Crown Corporate Committee. But that is the place that MPI or other Crown Corporation officials attend, not the estimates process of the budget. The Honourable Member for Concordia. Well, again, I, I mean, I'm kind of confused because the Minister on one hand is saying that he agrees that there should be a Crown Corporations meeting, um, and yet I haven't heard him say that he is willing to call that Crown Corporations meeting, so that's, that's very concerning. Um, uh, and so, you know, I, I think that this, this uh, venue, as I said, I do uh, see within the estimates book that this is part of the estimates of this department that's being considered here today. Uh, there is a line item that, uh, you know, and understand we're going to be uh, dealing with these issues in a global manner, so this uh, certainly is within the uh, purview of this committee. And, uh, I mean, I just question uh, how the minister expects to be able to answer technical questions about uh, expenditures without the proper departmental staff uh, available. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage him uh, that... Uh, he would have some kind of technical staff that would be able to answer the questions, that would be able to assist him. Uh, I know for mm -hmm. a fact that he doesn't have all those uh, numbers and facts and figures in his head, so uh, if we're going to get some uh, factual answers, I think that would be a, an appropriate uh, path forward. Mm -hmm. That being said, I do think that the, uh, the minister does have some staff here that do want to answer some questions with regards to justice. So, as I said, we're going to spend some time on MPI tomorrow, so I encourage the minister to get the uh, the proper staff available so that he can uh, get those answers when, when they're asked here in committee. Today, I'd like to ask some questions about the department uh, that uh, the, the staff that are here should be able to help him answer. Uh, and we'll start with, can the minister undertake to give a list of all technical appointments uh, in his department, including names and titles? Mm -hmm. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Well, and just to clarify the point that the, the member started off on, um, you know, he, he referred, I believe, it was to page 39 of the uh, supplemental estimates, uh, supplement of the estimates of expenditures book, and, and there's, a, there's a footnote on there. Maybe he didn't um, cast his eyes to the bottom of the page, but if he, if he looks at the footnote, it says, as an explanation in terms of the money. Uh, from MPI, there's you know 76 uh, million dollars that that the MPI is self-financed. It's not financed by the government of Manitoba. So this is just it's basically a flow-through, um, and it's not coming from the Department of um, of Justice because, as is noted in the in in the point that Manitoba Public Insurance Corporation is self-financed, and that is why the Crown Corporation um, Committee process. Uh, was established. Uh, you know, it, it's actually kind of ironic in some ways because the opposition 
uh, often talks about how they uh, you know, feel that crown corporations are, are being interfered with. That, that's like on a Monday. And then on Tuesday, they'll come into the question period and say, why don't you interfere with the crown corporation and do something? And then on Wednesday, they go, oh, you shouldn't have done something. Now you're interfering with the crown corporation. And like, like I, I understand the role of opposition. I understand there's a, an accountability a process to it. But I also think it's, it's helpful for opposition to be consistent, if not all the time, then at least within the same week. Um, and sometimes even within the same question period, you know, we have members who will stand up and say, why are you interfering? Then other members will stand up and say, don't interfere, um, or please interfere. And so that becomes, uh, you know, a bit of a challenge for, uh, for opposition to try to at least be consistent. So now he's coming to the Department of Justice and wanting to have justice officials answer questions that would be uh, impossible to answer because we're not interfering in the Crown Corporation on a day-to-day operational level. We don't provide day-to-day -day operational advice. Now, do we provide, you know, oversight through things such as directives, which is allowed under the, uh, one of the acts in our, uh, in Manitoba that allows us to provide directives, public directives that get published um, to, uh, to Crown Corporation. So the member will know that I recently issued, relatively recently, issued two directives. One was on the issue of untendered contracts. Um, and the member will also know that the NDP had many untendered contracts of high value that were issued by um, MPI when the NDP was in government. So I issued a directive to MPI that no untendered contract should be issued that's over $50,000. And then more recently, there was a directive on, our, on an organizational review uh, that was, was issued. Uh, not specific to Project Nova, because I, I know the member sometimes wants to make it that way, but to a number of different uh, issues to ensure that, you know, Manitobans, again, are getting the best service possible at the best possible price when it comes to Manitoba public insurance. I think that Manitobans would expect that. If the member opposite thinks that I'm, you know, interfering too much by issuing those directives, he can indicate that, but he also sometimes seems to be indicating that I'm not interfering enough. Um, so, I mean, I, you know, there were some concerns raised. I think that this government took the appropriate action. Um, the member doesn't believe we should have done anything, then he can state that for the record. But in terms of, you know, technical questions when it comes to the operation of MPI or Manitoba Public Insurance uh, or the uh, Liquor and Lottery Cannabis Corporation or the Centennial Corporation, which I think also gets called before the Crown Corporations, those are technical questions that get called to that particular committee because the officials of that committee are there. To start hauling in Crown Corporation officials into the estimates process uh, of, a, of a department which doesn't have direct you know, operational authority, uh, well, I think that you know, probably the more seasoned members of, of the opposition, such as the member for um, Elmwood, uh, would say, well, that that's not right. You know, that's not that's the you know when he's not talking about the Louis Bridge or catalytic converters, where he doesn't talk about catalytic converters anymore. But you know, he'd say that that that's not the right thing to do. That there, that's why we have Crown Corporations. He'll remember that. He'll remember that it was impossible to get his former government to call the Crown Corporations Committee. But I'm not like that. I'm not like the member for Elmwood. I like the member for Elmwood, but I'm not like the member for Elmwood. And I will ensure that a Crown Corporation Committee is called in the statutory uh, requirement. The Honourable Member for Concordia. Can the Minister give a list of all current vacancies in the Department by program area? The Minister. I think I'm actually one question behind. I think the last question he answered before this question, which I didn't hear, was about providing a list of technical uh, officers, and we'll, uh, we will in, uh, provide that. The Member for Concordia. And I think I remember uh, the minister's style with regards to uh, estimates is that uh, he tends to be one question behind. And so what I'm going to do, uh, just for the department staff and for the uh, for the minister's benefit, and maybe those watching at home, I, I hope that we have many viewers here this afternoon, uh, I'm going to continue to ask my questions. And if the minister is always one question behind in terms of his answer, that that's just fine. We, we will get the information as uh, as is appropriate then. So. Uh, I do want to ask questions about vacancies for Crown uh, Attorney specifically. How many vacancies province-wide with regards to uh, Crown Attorneys? 
the Honourable Minister. Uh, yeah, one could argue that, that I am behind the times, and, and uh, that's fine. I can like, live with that argument. I will uh, get the, uh, endeavour to get the information for the member. The member for Concordia. How many vacancies are in the Thompson office with regards to Crown attorneys? The Minister. I will undertake to provide that for the member as well. Member for Concordia. And uh, just to update the uh, committee here, I've been informed that there are currently 20 people watching on YouTube right now, so uh, it's not a bad audience, if, uh, if I do say so myself. So I'm, I'd like to welcome all of our viewers here this afternoon. <laughs> uh, how many vacancies are in the PAW office? The Honourable Minister. Yeah, I'd like to uh, also welcome the, uh, the 120 uh, viewers. I hope they keep, uh, uh, keep watching. I remember sometimes Gary Dewar, when he was actually sitting in this seat, would, uh, as a way of criticizing the opposition's questions, be motioning that people were using the remote control to turn away from question period because our questions weren't very good. So I won't do that to the, uh, to the member opposite. It was just one of my fonder memories of, of Mr. Dewar. We will uh, look to find the vacancy rates for uh, Crown prosecutions in the PAW and report back to the member. The member for Concordia. I'll ask the minister to check Hansard. I, in fact, said 20 viewers. However, uh, we can all just dream that it was 120 uh, and that we're uh, that popular. Uh, how many vacancies are in the Dauphin office? The Honourable Minister of Justice. I want to say how disappointed I am. I was really excited by the fact that there might have been 120 viewers, so 20, okay, so, so we minus the staff on their side and minus the staff on our side. I'm not sure how many actual viewers that we have, but I mean, to the three or four actual Manitobans then who are watching uh, this, we welcome them. We'll endeavour to get that uh, as well for the member. The member for Concordia. How many vacancies in the Brandon office? The minister. Provide that information to the member when I receive it. The member for Concordia. How many vacancies in the Portage La Prairie office? The Honourable Minister. Uh, just maybe in the expediency of this process, we'll endeavour to get all of the vacancies in all the different offices for the member. The Honourable Member for Concordia. Well, there's only one more, so I just want to make sure that I get that on the record with uh, regards to how many vacancies are in the Winnipeg office. Can the Minister endeavour to get that back? Uh, as as soon as possible. I, I'm not sure what is this. Uh, is there a reason why the minister can't provide these this information? Like, is this something he's going to get back within the next hour and 20 minutes? The honourable minister of uh, justice. Well, I can't provide it because I don't have it right here. But uh, we'll get it as soon as possible. I mean, in the next hour, it's not a McDonald's drive-through, right? We'll try to get it as quickly as possible and provide it to members. The honourable member for Concordia. Well, uh, again, so and, and again, I mean, you know, you'd figure after 13 years, I would understand uh, this process a little bit better. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what is, is the minister like. Are we are we able to delve into some of the details with regards to the department? And I know that his staff are currently uh, working very hard to get that information. So I'm just trying to get a sense of can we continue down this line of questioning today, or is this something that he's going to get to me like in writing, or like what, what is the process here? Because we, we kind of want to go through these questions and start getting some answers so that we can ask further questions building on those answers. The Honourable Minister. The member can go down any path he wants. That's his prerogative as, as a critic. He's sort of the bus driver in this, and uh, the rest of us are passengers. But you know, we'll provide the answers to him uh, in writing when we get the answers. The member for Concordia. Yeah, well, I mean, the bus driver is trying to figure out the best ways to, uh, to keep the passengers uh, productive and happy here in the committee. I think my analogy might have fallen apart there. But, uh, uh, but, uh, but I will say that uh, I, I think this is obviously a major uh, uh, area of concern. Uh, we know that uh, one of the largest groups of employees within the minister's department are the lawyers that serve as crown attorneys and prosecutors as with all sectors under this PC government, um, we're, we're starting to hear 
uh, some serious concerns and some uh, major uh, uh, concerns that are being expressed about the lack of sufficient resources to meet the demands that are being placed on those uh, employees. Uh, and we know that the work that they do is incredibly important. So I think that it's very important that we get this information um, as quickly as possible. So again, that we can get some more details and we can continue to, um, again, get some details. I, I did give the minister some uh, credit there to say that I understand he's not always, you know, and it's, I think it's a good way to perf be perfectly honest to answer questions in the estimates process. It, it takes some time for staff to pull together the information. So we want to give them the time to do it. Being one question behind makes some sense. So uh, maybe I'll just go back to uh, the provincial, the province-wide uh, vacancy rate. Can the minister, it's now been, I guess that's uh, five questions back, six questions back. Can we, can we get to the provincial-wide numbers and then we can have a discussion about that? The minister. I think I've already committed to um, providing uh, this answer uh, as soon as we can provide it. I, I don't know why the member won't take um, you know, my, my word for that, that we'll provide him the information. I, I don't think he should be overly suspicious, although I do remember in 2003 when I was elected in this process, I asked the then, I was critic actually for uh, conservation at the time, but I asked the then conservation minister, who I think was Stan Struthers, uh, for um, a report on parks that the department had commissioned. He promised to get it to me in 30 days, and that was 20 years ago and I haven't received it yet. So I'm not proposing to, um, to be in that particular league. I said that I would get the answer as soon as we could, and I would provide it uh, to the member, likely in writing, but if I can provide it to him tomorrow verbally, um, then I'll do that. But I will agree with the member on one point, because he made it early on, about the value of our Crown prosecutors. Very, very much in agreement uh, on that. Our Crown prosecutors, I believe, are among the best, uh, if not the best in Canada, they do, they do excellent work um, in, the, uh, in the Crown Prosecution's office in uh, difficult circumstances, not, not easy uh, work. And I know that uh, you know, even, even this year they've, they've suffered some loss, uh, personal loss in, in the department as a whole, uh, or the Crown Prosecution's office as a whole, and I know it was difficult uh, for them. So it's, it's been a difficult year on, on a number of different uh, fronts and I don't want to underestimate that or, or diminish that uh, because they do um, very, very significant work. But I also want to say for context, the member opposite said, I think erroneously, that there are significant vacancies in all parts of government because of actions by the government. I, I think he might want to acknowledge at least somewhat, you know, just because I think Manitobans are fair people that we're, we're dealing with, not just in Manitoba, but across North America, a general labor shortage. And um, not to draw a moral equivalency, uh, but you know, he could go and speak to, I think, any industry, and their number one concern would be labor shortage, um, whether that is the restaurant industry or the industrial industry or the professionals, you know, um, and, and lawyers. I mean, I talked to folks who are graduating from, from uh, law school. This year I just had an opportunity to speak to some uh, just a couple weeks ago and, and they really uh, are in high demand, uh, which is good if you're graduating from Robson Hall or other law schools around uh, the country, but it's a recognition that this is a certainly a North America problem, probably a global problem when it comes to shortage of labor uh, across the board, which impacts government of course, but not because of any particular action of the government. So I know the member opposite is a fair-minded individual and he'd want to recognize that uh, as well, that, that uh, there's a general global labor shortage in a number of different areas and attorneys are not untouched by that. The member for Concordia. Well, I mean, I would dispute much of what the minister has just put on the record, uh, but uh, the reality of that is, is that at this point it would simply be my words and his words and if people wanted to get more of that they could tune into question period any day of the week what we're in right now is the estimates process and so I'm not sure why the minister is just not you know again like I think maybe he's 
busy working right now trying to get some of these answers and that'd be fine he could just say that that he's getting these answers and then we can continue to talk but when he you know he's saying well this is just don't worry this is a problem everywhere and it's uh it's the same problem that ev that uh, every industry is having uh you know again i'd like to dispute that but i'd like to dispute that based on the facts and the facts of the vacancy uh, rate currently province-wide but then maybe as a further question, again, once we had that data in front of us, we could talk about, is this a trend? What has the trend been over the past five years? Has it been increasing? You know, what, what kind of information can uh, the minister give us that would give some indication about w what's actually happening in his department? Again, I know he doesn't have these answers, but why do we, why do we have staff and, and experts in the department if the minister is not going to even spend one minute asking them uh, and getting some answers like he, he criticizes the estimates process uh, that he experienced under uh, as a uh, official opposition member for many years you know and wants to dig up names from the past and say how terrible they were I, I don't think he'd want us to do the same about him so like <laughs> you know, I think this is the argument that you know you tell your kids don't not to make so anyway I'm not suggesting anyway in any way that the minister is making those kind of arguments what I'm saying is is that just, I will give him some time, like a few minutes, consult with staff, and then maybe just let me know, is this like, is this so far out of the range of what he thought we would be talking about today that there's just no way he could possibly ever answer it? Or it's like, yeah, it just, just he, you know, somebody needs to be texted and then the information will be here. Like, just tell us what's going on. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Well, I think I did tell the member uh, several times now that we are going to get the information and provide it to him. Uh, in terms of, you know, him worrying that or me worrying that he's going to dredge up my name negatively in uh, in a few years, um, he doesn't seem to be even waiting for a few years. I mean, that seems to happen on a daily basis. So I'm not particularly concerned or losing sleep or getting heartburn over that particular issue. Uh, I've indicated to the member we'll provide him the information and uh, and we will now I, I do though have to dispute a little bit um, the member seemed to dismiss the fact that there is a global work shortage she said that's not really the issue well it is the issue and if, if he attended uh, the Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce or the Manitoba Chamber of Commerce any of the events the many events that they have uh, he would find I think that the number one issue that uh, employers talk about and that they have is a labor shortage. Uh, that is the reality coming out of the last two years. And you know, I, I hear this all the time. The member might also hear it and just doesn't want to acknowledge it. But I hear it all the time from people who say, where did all the workers go? Like, where is everybody? Because you know, you're talking about you know, different uh, restaurants and otherwise they're advertising. Uh, I've, I've gone to restaurants where they've had to close down because they didn't have uh, employees. And there's a ripple effect uh, that goes right through the economy in different sectors uh, where there's a shortage and yet the member opposite who's you know he's, he's a bright he's a bright individual um, says that that there are no uh, there really aren't any labor shortages that's not the problem that is a problem and it is a global problem and so I would encourage the member to take some time meet with uh, Chuck Davidson uh, Lauren Remillard others who were involved in um, employment and, and to understand that it's a significant issue uh, in terms of you know where individuals are at or where they've gone I mean I, I know that and we've seen this even in justice and I think in government writ large that coming out of the the pandemic that there were people who for a variety of different reasons chose to go a different path and I think that that some folks who maybe were a couple of years from what they might have planned to be the retirement age said you know what like you know it's it's caused me the last couple of years to to rethink things and to maybe look at things a little bit differently and decide that they wanted to uh, go to an earlier uh, retirement and then that of course drew people up uh, into those uh, positions as they became vacant and we saw greater vacancies throughout government so um, you know, I, I think that the member is a little bit dismissive, and he may have just said that, you know, without without much thought. So I'm not going to continue to raise uh, this issue, uh, but I, but I do think it's important that he acknowledges that the labor shortage that is being experienced in Manitoba is being experienced in Saskatchewan, is being experienced in Alberta, in British Columbia, in Ontario, in Quebec, in Newfoundland, in New Brunswick, 
in Nova Scotia, in PEI, and in the territories, in every part of Canada, and I won't start listing through all the states, but I'm sure it'll be true in, in all the United States as well, there is a global labor shortage. Uh, it's one of the reasons why inflation has been difficult for the Bank of Canada, uh, although things are certainly getting better, uh, but while there's, why there's are still cautious, because they talk about the fact that there is a significant shortage of, of labor, and that's driving um, some of the uh, economic activity and driving the cost of labor, which drives the cost of goods, which drives inflation. And so they're concerned about, about that uh, part of the market because there is a shortage of labor. So I didn't want to leave the member's comments uh, un, uh, unrefuted, but again, he's, uh, we've given him an undertaking and we will uh, provide the information. The Honourable Member for Concordia. Well, so it sounds like there's a significant issue that the minister has in his department with regards to vacancies. It sounds like it's really, really bad. And uh, but, but, but again, I'm just just taking the minister's word for it rather than actually having the numbers in front of me that we can actually work with, uh, which is frustrating. And uh, I think it's uh, you know hampers the conversation that we can have here today about this important issue that the minister seems quite concerned about and the failures that have happened within his department. So I think we need to spend some time uh, talking more about that. Maybe I'll just put some more questions on the record that the minister, I don't know, will uh, uh, you know take uh, 13 years to respond to in writing is what uh, I'm getting a sense of here. Uh, how many resignations in the Winnipeg office have occurred within the last 12 months? And if the minister could also give me the information about how many resignations within the past 24 months. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairperson. So I want to uh, thank the uh, staff who are both here and uh, who are probably making up part of the 20 who are who are listening, who are diligently um, working to provide some numbers. I can provide to the member now that the vacancy rate for Crown attorneys in 2021, December of 20, oh sorry, for all of justice um, was, boy this is a big, you know, it's a larger a larger ask that we're delivering on now. So the vacancy rate at the end of 2021 in all of justice uh, was 13.6% and the vacancy rate for all of justice in um, December 31st of 2022 was 8.7%. So um, not quite half, but a significant uh, improvement and I wanna commend the uh, staff in justice who are tasked with working and filling those those vacancies for that, that significant improvement in what is a very difficult employment environment. The Honourable Member for Concordia. Thank the Minister for uh, actually uh, getting some data to the, uh, to the committee, actually uh, answering a question. It's a good start. Uh, we know that uh, demographic changes, many uh, uh, sorry, with demographic changes, many employees uh, are choosing to retire. And we also know that many are choosing to re retire earlier than they had perhaps originally planned to. And part of that is because, of course, of the increased workloads, uh, you know, uh, with regards to the, uh, the higher vacancy rates. Um, we also know that when those senior employees leave, uh, they take with them uh, a lot of experience and a lot of institutional knowledge that can be incredibly important to uh, to a department, especially a department like justice. Um, can the minister uh, quantify what kind of experience, or or maybe quantify it in the in the sense of years of experience that have been lost with the resignations that have been uh, uh, taken place within the Winnipeg office within the last 12 months, and again within the last 24 months. The Honourable Minister. So the member wants to talk in terms of quantity, but he, he framed his question more as a qualitative question. Although I would say that I think that we've made progress. Uh, he feels that it's a victory that there was uh, some data uh, brought forward, and I'm glad that, that he's taking that as a victory. Um, I take it as a victory that uh, he's now acknowledged two questions after indicating that that there wasn't really a labor shortage, that there actually is, and because people are are actually deciding to retire early in some cases. Now, he gave a qualitative framework to that, saying that 
people might be retiring because of high work uh, loads. And I, I'm not suggesting that in, in some cases that, that isn't the case. I mean, I'm sure people decide to retire for a lot of different reasons, but I've also indicated in a question or in an answer, uh, two answers ago, that I think coming out of uh, the pandemic, people made a lot of different life uh, decisions. We had people who decided to go back to school, who weren't planning to go back to school, but you know, the, 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 um, the unexpected uh, nature of the pandemic uh, caused them to rethink some of their goals. Uh, we had individuals who decided, you know what, I enjoyed working uh, at home and I don't want to necessarily go back to an office environment, even though in many cases that, you know, that's an important part of the job. Uh, and so they decided not to come back to work and to take an early uh, retirement. Uh, there are folks, I think, who, you know, I don't want to be too uh, euphemistic about this, but I think they rediscovered their families during those two years and suddenly, you know, they were spending lots of time with their, their grandkids maybe, um, which they hadn't been before and said, you know what, like I'm not willing to give that up. And so th those are more qualitative decisions and life decisions that people make um, and that people have the right to make. Again, not that there might not be some individuals who, you know, in different fields who decide to leave because of workload. Workload driven because there's a labor shortage, which the member previously denied as being an issue, but now seems to be acknowledging that a labor shortage drives or can drive workload in certain fields when there's a, a labor shortage and there's not enough people coming in. But I want to go back to the point because the member sort of framed this as being um, a problem that isn't uh, being solved or that doesn't have a solution. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that there's a mission accomplished sign being hung up, but the statistics that I provided in the previous answer showed that the vacancy rate in the Department of Justice was almost cut in half. Uh, and in, a, in an environment where there is a uh, shortage of labor, that's a really, really significant accomplishment. It's not the ultimate outcome, but it is a significant accomplishment. So I think we're making um, great progress actually during this estimates process because the member is getting data. I am able to convince him that there's actually a labor shortage uh, in the world uh, and that our government is, uh, or this department at least, has been able to make significant uh, advancements um, on reducing the shortage or reducing the vacancies. The Honourable Member for Concordia. Uh, well, no, I, I do think that this is information that the Minister should be tracking, and so I hope that he is. Um, I, I think this information about years of experience that have been uh, lost with these resignations uh, is is important, and it is a, uh, a number that he could uh, certainly uh, give to the committee. Uh, and if he's not tracking it, maybe something that could be worked up uh, fairly quickly. Uh, I think it's important that we understand not just the number of folks that we've lost, but the years of experience that we've lost and the impact that that's going to have on our justice system and the confidence that people can have in it. So uh, I hope that the Minister will uh, endeavour to get that information back to the committee. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. I, you know, I don't dismiss what the member is saying. I mean, when you lose um, people with seniority in, in an organization, uh, it, it has an impact. Um, and I don't think anybody would dismiss that. I mean, that, that's true in the Department of Justice and might be true in a political party, right? When, uh, when there's turnover with members who've been a long time, you know, it, it has an impact in terms of institutional uh, knowledge. But it also can sometimes have um, a bit of a benefit in that it can bring new ideas and fresh ideas to any organization, whether that's um, justice or to a department or to any other sort of um, political organization or any other organization. Um, uh, when you have a turnover of people who've been there for a long time, um, you are uh, sorry for the loss of that institutional or historical knowledge. Um, but you also welcome the new ideas and sometimes energy that comes in with the new individuals who um, come into the organization. I've experienced that in, in departments long before uh, a pandemic where I've, I've you know, lost uh, uh, folks who decided to retire at, at senior levels who were instrumental 
two of the departments, and of course I'm always I'm glad for them because they often are, are retiring and um, and being able to spend more time with their family. Um, I think of um, uh, folks like uh, Grant Doak, who used to be my deputy minister uh, in the Department of Education. Just a just a wonderful individual who I still maintain contact with. Uh, a longtime deputy minister in government. Uh, there's no question that uh, him leaving was a loss, um, and that and that I personally missed him. But I think you know the department missed him. But then Dana Rudy, who's the current deputy minister, uh, came in not long after uh, he left, and and brought in just a wonderful array of skills and and new ideas that were that were really uh, helpful at looking at uh, at things. I think of uh, the Department of Health now, where uh, Karen Hurd, I think the longest serving. Deputy Minister of Health in Canada recently announced uh, her retirement, and I had the opportunity to work with Karen for a number of years, and just really, really valued her uh, her input. But you know, her ability to manage complex and a multitude number of files um, was really, really uh, impressive. Um, but I'm also happy for her because now she gets to spend uh, more time with her husband, who's been retired for. A number of years, I think they just were traveling, and and so I'm happy for her personally, even though there was a loss. But now we have Scott Sinclair, I think, who's come into that role as Deputy Minister of Health, who will bring a f his own sort of you know new and fresh uh, perspectives to a very very difficult and complex file. I think of the Department of Justice, where um, former Deputy Minister Dave Wright uh, recently retired. Now the member opposite might <laughs> think that there's some problem with me that all of my deputy ministers leave, but uh, Dave Wright. Um, uh, retired uh, after having been in this building for a long time. He was uh, did legislative drafting for a long time, so the member opposite might have worked with him in terms of drafting uh, bills. Uh, and I had a great respect for for Dave, and um, and uh, you know he just chose to spend more time with his wife and his family. And and I'm I'm glad I was glad for him personally, but of course I was sorry to see him go. But very happy to see Jeremy Akerstream. Uh, fill the position, and Jeremy has been brought for you know many uh, new ideas and perspectives that have also been helpful. So you know that may be a long way to answer the member's question, and that yes, you you do uh, lose something when uh, individuals with long-term experience leave any organization, um, but you often gain uh, things as well, and that's new perspectives and new energy, and 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 that's how I try to look at it, not not simply as a loss. Uh, but also as the opportunity to uh, to bring uh, have new ideas and new perspectives. The honourable member for Concordia. I think that's what the kids nowadays call shower thoughts. Uh, the minister uh, hopefully will be able to get that information at the committee. Going back to each of the regional offices, how many competitions in those offices? Let's say in the past year. Um, has, uh, I mean, preferably 2023, but uh, up till this current date in 2023, but 2022 would be, uh, uh, would be uh, acceptable. How many of those uh, competitions within those regional offices has been unsuccessful in filling a vacancy? The Honourable Minister. So I'm sort of reluctant to um, to respond to the shower comments comment by the minister because I'm not quite sure or member because I'm not quite sure what that meant. Um, um, and, I, and I see other uh, people who are whimsical in the chamber 
uh, about it or questioning about it, but maybe that's just a reflection of our age, or my age, uh, for sure. Um, so it was, an, it was an odd comment that uh, I'll just, I guess, leave as sitting as an odd comment. Uh, but I do, I do want to say, though, that I was quite serious about the folks that I, that I mentioned by name who I truly enjoyed uh, working with. And, and there's a longer list than that that I could uh, provide. Uh, I, I've been, I feel that I've been very blessed uh, with the individuals I've been able to work with uh, in government at uh, senior levels, uh, the deputy minister's levels. I've, I've just been very, very lucky. They've uh, not only been very skilled individuals, um, but I personally got along quite, uh, quite well with them. And so, um, you know, sometimes I think, uh, not from us, but I, I think that there are people maybe of, of the 20 people who are watching, you know, people might say, you might not always know what uh, senior civil servants do or, or maybe don't always appreciate the work that they do, but I've really grown to, to appreciate that, you know, more in the last seven years than I, than I would have in the previous 13 years, although I had a strong appreciation then too. Uh, what I can say to the member in terms of data, because I know he's looking for data, is that uh, the department had uh, 16 uh, new hires in the year 2021-2022 and 19 in the year 2022-2023, and that there are currently in the Department of Justice 124 individuals who have 10 years or more of experience. So, you know, obviously significant experience, we value uh, experience, we also value fresh ideas and people who come from, uh, from different places and bring uh, insight and wisdom with them when they're coming from other places. But I was also reminded that many of the questions the members asking when it comes to, um, you know, advertising for positions and how many people apply, those are run by the Civil Service Commission, uh, not generally by justice directly. So. Uh, I'm not sure where the Civil Service Commission is on the order of estimates. Uh, maybe it's already happened, and if that's the case, then the member uh, could hold his questions till next year, uh, or he could, uh, I suppose, file a FIPO or something like that. But um, you know, questions on uh, who's, you know, how many people have have uh, replied to uh, a uh, an advertisement for a job. Uh, those are run through. Um, through the Civil Service Commission, but again, just to restate, because I, I want to ensure that he knows I'm delivering him hard data on issues, 16 new hires in 2021-22, uh, 19 in 20, 2022, 2023, and there are 124 individuals that have 10 years of experience or more, which probably doesn't include me, uh, even though I've been here for 20 years. The Honourable Member for Concordia. Just to uh, confirm, that information is with regards to the Crown Attorneys, 122 individuals with 10 years of experience or more. Also, ask, I'd like to ask the Minister what the average level of experience is of new hires into the Crown's office. Are they coming, for instance, straight out of law school or articling, or you know, maybe he could give us some perspective exactly where these um, new hires are coming from. The Honourable Minister. Yeah, I, I, we don't have any uh, stats on that uh, here at the moment. I'm, I'm not sure what kind of uh, data we could provide, but I, the members asked lots of questions about vacancies, and uh, you know we'll ensure that we uh, fulfill our commitment on on the issue of vacancies. But again, I, I'd, re, I'd restate that the issue of, of hiring crown attorneys is a challenge, as it is a challenge in every province as it is a challenge in many different departments, in many different fields. Uh, some of it is a newer challenge, most of it is not. I mean, there's been an aging demographic long before the pandemic shook up the, the work environment. We had an aging demographic that was causing challenges in a variety of places of government and the work, uh, workplace more generally. Um, and, uh, and so there's no question that, that it's difficult. Um, but we do have, uh, you know, we have articling students that come into uh, prosecutions. I think it's uh, uh, just short of 10, so maybe about nine articling students uh, who come in. And, you know, we always hope that those individuals will, will stay in prosecutions. 
um, and find it a rewarding uh, career. And, and you know, that's maybe something we'll look at doing uh, more of. But I, I can tell you that you know, there's always active recruitment that's happening when it comes to prosecutions, whether it's uh, those coming right out of law school, those who've had longer uh, experience in their legal practice, uh, or those from other jurisdictions. But it's a challenge, as it is in every province. I don't want to. I don't want to diminish that or, or say that it's not difficult. The Honourable Member for Concordia. So um, what I'm hearing from the Minister now is he's admitting that there is a, an active recruitment process because what, we're here, what we heard first was, uh, well, you know, how could we ever know this? This is, passive, uh, this is a passive process. It's the uh, Civil Service Commission who's uh, involved in that part of it. But now he's saying there is some sort of active process that his department is undertaking to uh, deal with the vacancies. Uh, so I, I want to understand better who those uh, who those recruit where, where that recruitment effort is being undertaken. Uh, are is the minister specifically? Are they going after experienced lawyers, for instance, from the defense bar? Are they going uh, to other provinces? Uh, does the minister feel that the the uh, what's on offer here in Manitoba is competitive and and would attract those sorts of people? Who who is applying and? And uh, where are we getting these uh, additional people uh, that, that are so needed? Obviously, the minister admits, uh, where are we getting them from? The Honourable Minister. Yeah, just for, uh, just for clarity's sake. So, uh, the member hits on a, on a good point. Uh, Civil Service Commission, you know, is responsible for the through their human resource function, is responsible for the advertising of positions. That would be, I think, you know, largely the case in most places in government, um, core government. Although I, I suppose the like, regional health authorities would be involved in in uh, some of their own. Uh, specific recruitment because they would be, uh, you know, reporting entities outside of, of government, um, but um, but the department itself is certainly, you know, involved and invested in recruitment strategies and ways in which we can recruit uh, crown attorneys either fresh out of law school or from other provinces or from um, or in other means and other ways to attract individuals. So the advertising, I think, specifically is a function of uh, the Public Service Commission, but there's no question the Department of Justice would be involved with the recruitment strategies. The Honourable Member for Concordia. So, Mr. Aware that uh, provinces like BC are paying an incentive to Crowns uh, to recruit people away from provinces like Manitoba? The Honourable Minister. Yeah, I mean, I'm aware that there is, you know, when it comes to Crowns or other positions within government. There's a variety of different strategies that, that happen around um, Canada. This speaks to my point. I know that the member opposite earlier dismissed the fact and didn't and, and indicated there wasn't, you know, a labor shortage uh, in Canada. Uh, now he seems to be countering that point by pointing out that in many jurisdictions, uh, you know, that there's aggressive recruitment that's uh, that's happening. We see that of course in the healthcare field and Member will know about a $200 million investment as an example in terms of trying to recruit individuals into uh, the healthcare field. I mean, we obviously uh, work to try to recruit people into uh, the Crown Attorney's uh, Division. Other jurisdictions are doing the same because there is a global labor shortage, or certainly one in North America. Again, I didn't have researched every other country in the world, but certainly in, in North America, there's a significant labor shortage uh, that is causing a number of different challenges in a number of different places, some of which is driven by the pandemic, some of which I think is driven by, by demographics that existed before. So um, yes, I, I'm glad that the member has come uh, to this realization after um, an hour and a half that there's a significant uh, a shortage of, of individuals in a number of different fields, and that includes Crown Attorneys, which we're not either dismissive uh, about or, uh, or ununderstanding about. I mean, we, uh, 
we know the important work that they do and, and the important link they are within the justice system. We value the Crown Attorneys in Manitoba and the good work that they do and the good people who are in uh, that department. And we know that uh, there is a shortage of them, um, certainly in Canada and, and probably in North America and maybe globally. The Honourable Member for Concordia. Is the Minister aware of the current and recently updated salary structure for Crowns and Prosecutors in Saskatchewan? The Honourable Minister. Uh, you know, I, I have uh, some tertiary knowledge of, of some of the um, uh, different pay scales when it comes to Crown Attorneys in, in different jurisdictions. You know, I, I do want to say, uh, before we head too far, down this road, and I'm not suggesting the member's going here, although sometimes the flavor and question period from some of his colleagues uh, about trying to negotiate contracts off of the uh, floor of the legislature or off of the desk of the minister. Um, I'm not suggesting that the member for Concordia is moving down that, that direction, but I, I want to ensure that that he knows that uh, you know when it comes to negotiations or labor or, or contracts, and most of those are uh, are negotiated through a different department. Um, you know, I'm going to be very cautious what I say when uh, he knows full well that there's currently an active negotiation with Crown Attorneys. But yes, in a broad, uh, in a broad sense, I have some uh, uh, some tertiary knowledge of uh, pay scales in uh, other provinces. The Honourable Member for Concordia. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, is, it, is the minister concerned at all that he's not offering uh, job opportunities that potentially would be as seen as attractive here in this province, considering there is a significant issue in terms of uh, uh, recruitment and uh, issue with regards to vacancy rates? Uh, does he is he not concerned that the uh, offer that's being uh, put out uh, here in the province of Manitoba is not competitive? Uh, with other provinces, including the one right next door to us. The Honourable Minister. Uh, again, the, men, the member seems to be drifting into the lane of, uh, of trying to draw me into active negotiations uh, that are currently, um, you know, vested in the Department of Labour and, and into negotiations that are happening with Crown Attorneys. And uh, while he might be tempting me to go into that lane, I, I, I won't uh, agree to do that. But he did speak about, you know, my concern that it's not attractive to be um, a crown attorney, and you know, I don't want to start, you know, putting qualitative comments on that. Other than to say, I believe that our crown attorneys uh, are skilled, are professional, uh, are highly motivated, uh, are a strong team, uh, and we value them. Now, contract negotiations are contract negotiations. They shouldn't be done off the desk of uh, the minister. They should be done in a, in a proper collective bargaining process. Uh, and, and we'll respect the proper collective bargaining process. But I, I, I would hope that the member opposite was not suggesting that it's not uh, good work or not valuable work to be um, a Crown attorney, because I believe that, that it is. Uh, both in Manitoba and it's valuable work at other places too. Um, but, uh, but I'm not dismissive of the challenge it is to recruit Crown Attorneys. I'm not dismissive of the challenge it is to recruit nurses or doctors or technicians or paramedics uh, or people in a variety of different industries. You can come to my community and we can talk to different corporations or companies who can't get welders. Uh, who can't get electricians, who can't get tradespeople, not because of a lack of pay, um, but because it is a highly competitive market uh, for all of these different areas.
The Honorable Member for Concordia. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Appreciate it. It's uh, quite uh, remarkable that the minister is, uh, you know, taking it upon himself to uh, get into a uh, bargaining on the floor of the estimates process <laughs> with regards to uh, Crown prosecutors. When I'm simply uh, talking about a current contract and comparing that with, uh, of course, our neighbors in Saskatchewan and uh, uh, jurisdictions like BC who are being quite aggressive with regards to their recruitment within uh, our province and others. And so it's quite telling actually that the minister would uh, automatically go there. Uh, but it, what I'm doing here is I'm giving him an opportunity. This should be like, a, what do they call this? A softball right over the plate. And uh, it, it's really just a minister's opportunity to sort of go off about this amazing recruitment project that they've uh, developed within their department talk about all the incentives and all of the uh, all, all of the uh, uh, quality of life stuff that they're working on the the techniques that they're using to reach out to as I said experienced uh, prosecutors to look out um, across jurisdictions pull them into Manitoba I mean there should be uh, you would hope a lot there but I'm quite concerned that we're now, I think, four questions into this line of questioning and the minister hasn't given us, given us anything. He says there's a problem. We know they created, the PC government created a problem. We all agree on that. That's the starting point. Now we need to understand what the answer and what the solution is. And I'm surprised given these, as I said, lobs over the plate that the minister isn't willing to uh, to take a swing at them and tell us, tell the people of Manitoba if he really thinks that there's a, a uh, recruitment and retention problem in uh, the Crown's department. Certainly we've seen that in the media. We know the challenges that we've had uh, across the province. Uh, if there, he's acknowledging there's a problem, uh, he knows that other jurisdictions are doing a lot to fix the problem. What is this minister doing to fix the problem? And how is he going to restore uh, you know, the people's uh, confidence in the justice system uh, if he himself doesn't seem to have an answer for this? The Honourable Minister. Well, there would probably take more than five minutes, so maybe the member will give me leave to go a little further because he, he delved at the end into the confidence of the justice system, and I would love to speak a bit about that because I think it's, uh, it's a broader question and a broader issue that he was tying to one particular area, but I think is, is further than that. But he did start uh, his question by saying that there was a common agreement that this was a problem created by the government. So, I mean, I, you know, it's almost like the lob, uh, the lob question. He knows I'm not going to let that stand on, on the record because there is not common agreement on that. I think where there is common agreement is that we have a labor shortage in uh, North America, that this was not created by the government of Manitoba. It wasn't created by the government of Saskatchewan. I'll even say it wasn't created by the government of British Columbia, uh, the new democratic government in British Columbia. It wasn't created by any particular provincial government. These are global factors um, that were probably, what well, they were there before the pandemic as we were dealing with an aging population. That was well acknowledged. It was acknowledged by previous NDP governments in this province that there was you know, labor shortages. Um, I could remind the member opposite, I suppose, that this isn't even new when it comes to Crown attorneys in particular, that there were challenges under the former NDP government when it came to recruiting and retaining Crown attorneys at some, uh, at some points in their administration. But what we have right now in particular and specifically uh, is a labor environment that the member now sort of seems to agree is a problem, but we don't, can't seem to agree on why it became a problem. He seems to think it's uh, purely a Manitoba problem. But since he uh, has obviously gone on to, to Google and looked at other provinces, he might also want to then continue his Google search and, and look at every jurisdiction that is dealing with labor issues in healthcare, in justice, in industry, uh, in the retail sector, Every jurisdiction is struggling when it comes to recruiting employees. Some of that are pre-existing factors. Some of that is specifically because of what happened uh, during the pandemic and people making decisions um, that maybe were uh, different than might have happened if, had the pandemic not occurred. And so, you know, the member opposite feels that we've 
reach some sort of common ground or common accord on the reason for a global uh, labor shortage. He seems to feel that the global, global labor shortage uh, is a result of uh, actions in Manitoba. Uh, and clearly that is, well, I don't want to say ludicrous because that would be insulting, but it's clearly not right. Uh, and that there are a lot of difficult factors. So yes, um, the Department of uh, Justice is well aware of the different places where you know, they're working on recruitment. I think I uh, indicated to the member several questions ago that there's been a significant reduction in the vacancy rate in justice uh, globally overall, and that is because there has been significant work when it comes to recruitment. Now, the member seems to dismiss that or forgotten that, that even in an environment where there's a real challenge in getting uh, employees in every sector, in every province, uh, in Canada and throughout North America, uh, the department has been able to reduce, and I give credit to officials on this, they've been able to reduce the vacancy rate in the uh, department from I think it was around 13.5% to around 8.5%. Not saying that, that you know, we don't want it to be, to be less and that there's not more work happening, but I have yet to hear the member acknowledge that that's significant and to you know, give credit where credit is due to the officials in the department who are working to ensure that there is significant recruitment. So to answer his question, he seemed to be dismissive of the fact that there's been a significant reduction in the vacancy rate in the Department of Justice. I hope he'll acknowledge that even in a very difficult and tight labor market, there has been a significant uh, reduction in the vacancy rate. The Honourable Member for Concordia. Well, uh, another swing and a miss, uh, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Chair, and, uh, and and you know, and, and particularly transparent too. Uh, in in and uh, you know, I mean, dismissive of, of these important questions because the minister was able somehow to uh, to pull out two numbers that he thought were favorable to him uh, out of the entire myriad of, of figures that uh, are available to him. Uh, those are the two that he pulls out, but he refuses to answer our questions here this afternoon with regards to how many vacancies within the Crown Attorney's uh, Department uh, or, or uh, a section in particular, and uh, and with regards to those particular offices that we asked about. So, uh, you know, again, I'm going to give the Minister the benefit of the doubt that uh, we've got half an hour left. and. Uh, it only took an hour to get that other piece of data, so maybe he can. I don't know. Maybe he can get this one too. Uh, let's hope so. But I, I, I maybe I shouldn't hold my breath. Uh, I do want to switch gears slightly. Uh, talk to the minister a little bit more about um, uh, a little bit about uh, corrections. Uh, uh, ask specifically about vacancies within the corrections department. Can we get the percentage and the number of vacancies versus the number of filled positions within corrections um, or, or EFTs, whatever the uh, minister has handy? Can the minister get that information to the committee? Honourable Minister. I mean, the member will know I'm not uh, easily offended at this uh, stage of my career. It would take a lot uh, for me to, to go home and lose sleep over some of the comments for the member for Concordia, though I quite like him individually. Um, you know, but he started off his, his, he started off his comments about, you know, swing and a miss, which, which seemed kind of dismissive to the efforts, I think, of, of those who are really, you know, working on a difficult file. Um, you know, I mentioned to him earlier about you know, articling students, those who are, you know, fresh out of, uh, out of law school. And I know that I'm not, I'm not trying to draw an equivalency between senior crown attorney or uh, an articling student. I recognize that, you know, on either side of that, of that stream, it's important to ensure that there's um, strong efforts. Um, but I don't want to be dismissive of it uh, either, right? I mean, you know, when you can get uh, new lawyers or those who are articly and, and ready to be called to the bar into um, prosecutions, I think there is a significant opportunity uh, to show them, you know, why it's good work, why it's valued work, why it's important work, uh, the strength of that team that exists within uh, prosecutions. So I mentioned before that there were nine articly students in the city of Winnipeg. Um, there are 13 uh, overall in the province of, uh, of Manitoba, which is an increase 
uh, from what it was, I believe, when the NDP were in, uh, in government. So that would be a, an increase, not a decrease. Uh, I can't speak to why there were fewer when the NDP were in government. Maybe if they were more aggressive, having articling uh, students uh, at that time, of course, that might, have, uh, that might have been helpful in terms of the number of Crown attorneys that we'd have in, um, in the department right now. But, you know, he may want to go back and speak to some of his former friends, um, uh, Dave Chomiak or Gord McIntosh or uh, others who served uh, uh, James Allen, others who served uh, in the role in terms of why they didn't increase the number of, uh, of articling students. But I'm glad that, that we have because we recognize that, that that's uh, important. That's one, that's one aspect. That's one part of the stream. I'm not trying to suggest that that uh, is, the only, uh, is the only part of uh, the recruitment strategy. There's, there's a lot of other things that are involved, but it's not insignificant. And the member started his question by kind of dismissing it and saying, well, you know, swing and a miss, it's not that important. It is important, actually. And, um, and I think dismissive comments don't, uh, don't serve the member well, uh, and they don't serve the process uh, well. So, you know, I hope he'll reflect upon that and, and, and recognize and, and realize that there's good work and hard work being done in, in a difficult uh, environment when it comes to the labor shortage and that there's uh, no shortage of efforts to deal with that. But, again, I'm not going to get into specifics about any sort of ongoing, uh, you know, contract uh, discussions or, or, or that process. And um, I know the member said he's not trying to draw me into that, but he seems to be flying pretty close to the sun in a, in a lot of different ways. So, um, you know, I'm hopeful that he's uh, not looking to continue that, uh, that line of uh, questioning, but maybe he wants to repeat the question that he had in the area of corrections. The Honourable Member for Concordia. Uh, well, uh, the minister continues to uh, prove to the committee that he can bring forward facts and information. I appreciate that he continues, though, uh, you know, rather than just giving us the information that I've been asking for, he's just cherry picking numbers, which which isn't helpful. Again, in question period, I think uh, you know, I, there's very limited ability for us to get into the details. I, you know, the minister doesn't have staff sitting in front of him uh, in the in the question period. So uh, you know, I mean, I would suggest that it would make more sense at those uh, during those times to say take the question on notice. Uh, but uh, in this case, the minister does have that information at his fingertips, so to speak. So he gets the information, but he only gives the the pieces that you know he he thinks make him look uh you know good but but it's very transparent manitobans see through this stuff so like let's get the information we're asking for uh can the minister indicate the number of positions both vacant and filled and the vacancy rate at the brandon correctional center The Honourable Minister. I'm advised that the positions uh, in Brandon are all filled. The Honourable Member for Concordia. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, then uh, can the Minister give me the uh, number of positions um, at, at Brandon Correctional Centre? 
as well as the vacancy rate and number of positions at Headingley Correctional Center, Milner Ridge Correctional Center, the Correctional Center in the Paw, the Winnipeg Remand Center, the Women's Correctional Center, and the Manitoba Youth Center. The Honorable Minister. Other than, uh, you know, us collecting that over the next 10 or 15 minutes, I don't want to burn the member's time uh, because I know that uh, he has valuable uh, questions. So uh, we'll endeavor to get the information and report back to him tomorrow at the beginning of the uh, estimates process. The Honourable Member for Concordia. No, we have time. Uh, this is, I, I would like the Minister to answer these so that we can answer follow, ask follow-up questions to these, uh, que these uh, questions that have been posed. And uh, I appreciate that the Minister has the information in front of him because he was able to answer the Brandon Correctional Centre question quite quickly. In fact, I think that took like less than 10 seconds. So let's just go through the list and uh, get those answers on the record now. The Honourable Minister. Uh, I'm more than happy then to, it's not going to be less than 10 seconds. We'll take the time if the member wants to uh, spend uh, 10 or 15 minutes talking to his colleagues, we will uh, endeavour to get some information for him. The Honourable Member for Concordia. Yeah, let's get those answers on the record. Uh, can the Minister also then indicate with a breakdown from the complement of those uh, corrections officers, how many are men, identify as men, how many uh, as women, uh, how many are Indigenous, uh, and any other factors that uh, the Department, uh, uh, information that the Department collects? The Honourable Minister. Uh, rather than stacking up questions like planes trying to get on a runway, I'm going to endeavour to get the information of the first question that the member asked, which I said is going to take some time, but which he was quite fine with, uh, and then he can repose the question that he just asked. The Honourable Member for Concordia. Well, I think we're actually, if we're talking about stacked questions, I think we're at about 14 that are unanswered that the Minister has said he's going to get back to me, so I don't see why that's going to change anything. Let's continue to stack those questions, and as the answers come in, the Minister can give them to me in a straightforward way. We can just continue on. That's the po process that we're in right now. It's called estimates. That's what we're doing here. So I, I prefer that the Minister just uh, be collect these questions, answer them as the, the answers come in. Uh, can the Minister indicate how many beds are currently in our correctional institutions and um, whether that number has increased or decreased since 2016? The Honourable Minister. So the member, I think two questions ago, asked a question and said he had lots of time to wait for the answer. Uh, and then he started to fire off a bunch of, of other questions. So I'm still back in the process of waiting uh, to get the information for that first question. So he can continue to fire off uh, questions if he chooses. Uh, but I'm going to get him to, uh, the information on the first question, which he said he was going to patiently wait for, and now seems to have lost his patience for. And once I get him that information, then he can restart the other questions that he uh, is now not seeming to want to wait for. Member for Concordia. Well, like I said, uh, Mr. Chair, that's 19 questions now, I think, that are uh, outstanding. So I, I, I mean, this has been the entire process here. I'm not sure why the Minister thinks it's now somehow different. I, th I was understanding that he was still trying to get me questions on vacancies with regards to the Winnipeg office, the office in the PAW, with regards to Crown Prosecutors. So that's still outstanding. Those are stat what he's calling stacked questions. Great. Let's keep going and let's keep getting the answers here. Like as they Stack come in, up. just get, give them to the committee, give them to Manitobans, tell them what's going on, and then we'll just keep moving on. Like I, I don't think, I don't know what the minister thinks this is. Okay, so we're looking for, of course, the total uh, with regards to how many beds, but in particular, we want to know in the uh, Brandon Correctional off, uh, Center, the Headingley Correctional Center, Milner Ridge, the PAW, the Winnipeg Remand Center, and the Women's Correctional Center as well. Uh, along with the youth center, can the minister indicate how many beds are in those uh, institutions and uh, whether that they have increased or decreased since 2016? The honourable minister. Uh, nope, I have not committed to providing any of the information on the last three questions. What I said to the member is on that first question. It was going to take some time to get the information. Staff are compiling the information now. 
I said to him it could be 10 to 15 minutes, and he said, oh, he's got lots of time. And I don't know what happened if he all of a sudden got a text from somebody and says he doesn't got lots of time or what the issue is. Um, but I gave him fair warning uh, that it was going to take some time to get that initial question uh, answered, and then he could go back into this uh, uh, line of questioning, and I'm happy to provide that information. But he's the individual who offered up to take uh, the 10 or 50, I, I offered to take the question actually as notice and to provide the information back first thing tomorrow. He uh, dismissed that and says that he didn't want that. He wanted to, um, he wanted to take 10 or 50 minutes to get the information and then decided to fire off a bunch of questions after that and not wait the 10 or 50 minutes. So no, there's not been an undertaking on any of the other questions that he's asked except for the initial one where we told him it would take 10 or 50 minutes and I see that Folks are diligently working here now. I mean, again, I mean, he's, he seems to be—he seems to be caught in a web of his own making. Um, but he—he uh, he said he would be happy to wait for the uh, answers, and the answer to that original question is coming. The Honourable Member for Concordia. So we're on to like almost two hours and the Minister has been asked I think 23, 24 questions by now. He's saying no, I'm not going to answer any of them. Throw them all out the window because uh, <laughs> because he's having some trouble keeping up, writing them down. I mean he was spending a lot of time uh, talking about past glories and his time in other departments and he was, I mean, this, this went on and on and on and this was, uh, this was a whole, uh, a whole dog and pony show and then uh, all of a sudden he says, no, uh, any questions that I said I would answer, no, no, I'm not going to answer them. I mean, what an abdication of uh, duty and responsibility as a minister. This is embarrassing. This is, uh, this is, this is disgusting that the minister would even suggest that he wouldn't answer questions uh, coming from uh, the official opposition in the House of the Legislature when, uh, you know, the estimates process is specifically set up for him to be accountable for the questions that uh, that are asked and, and the decisions made in his, in his government. Uh, unbelievable that he would even put that on the record, that he wouldn't answer the questions that have been asked in this process here in uh, committee. And I guess just for the record, and so that the minister can be incredibly clear about the questions that have been asked. I'm going to just go through those questions again so that he has them on the record. And, that, you know, he said at the beginning of this process, well, there's no possible way I can get those answers. Then he started picking and choosing which ones he wanted to answer and which pieces of data that he wanted to bring forward. And now he says any of those questions aren't actually questions. So I hear a call for some questions, and I think we can get through this. Uh, I asked, can the minister undertake to give a list of all technical appointments in their department, including names and titles? I asked the minister give a list of all current vacancies in the department or program area. I asked about uh, recruitment of crown attorneys, uh, regional offices, uh, how many competitions in those offices, let's say in the past year or in 23 uh, 2223 uh, have been uh, successful. Uh, how many weren't able to fill a vacancy in the Thompson office, the Dauphin office, the the um the PAW, Brandon, Portage, and Winnipeg. I asked the average level of experience of new hires in the Crown's office. Are they coming straight out of law school? Are they articling? Has uh, he attracted any lawyers from the defense bar? Has he uh, found any uh, Crowns from other provinces? Has the minister, uh, what are the vacancies province-wide with regards to the Crown's office, the Crown Attorney's office? How many vacancies are in the Thompson office? How many are in the PAW office? How many are in Dauphin? How many are in Brandon? How many are in the Pro Portage La Prairie office? Uh, uh, I asked about how many resignations have happened in the Winnipeg office in the last 12 months. I asked how many resignations have happened in the Winnipeg office in the last 24 months. I asked about demographic changes and how many are retiring earlier than they plan to. How many years of experience have been lost through that process? Is there a reason why the minister doesn't track that information more carefully? I, I asked the minister about his awareness of the BC programs uh, incentivizing Crown prosecutors to come from provinces like Manitoba. I asked the minister about uh, the uh, current and updated salary structure for Crowns and Prosecutors in Saskatchewan. I asked him if he was concerned about this and if he could give us any kind of recruitment or retention uh, a strategy, and he couldn't, of course, but you know that was a question that we asked. I asked how many beds 
uh, were in our uh, corrections institutions, whether they've increased or decreased, I asked for a breakdown by Brandon, Headingley, Milner Ridge, the Paw, Winnipeg, the Women's Correctional Center and the Manitoba Youth Center. I asked how many corrections officers uh, are currently vacant, what the vacancy rate is amongst them. I asked uh, what the percentage was and I asked the number of vacancies versus the number of filled positions. I asked the minister if he could indicate the number of positions both filled and vacant and, vac and, the, vac and the vacancy rate at the Brandon Correctional Center, the Headingley Correctional Center, the uh, Milner Ridge, the Paw, Winnipeg, uh, Women's Correctional Center, and the Manitoba Youth Center, and asked the minister if he could indicate with a breakdown of those uh, complement of corrections officers how many are women, how many are Indigenous, how many are, are uh, men. I still have more. And uh, the minister now, because I didn't see him writing these down furiously, I guess, is counting on maybe those 20 people who are watching on YouTube to give him an answer. Or maybe uh, he could check answered. But regardless, it's his duty to answer these questions. Like, like I don't know what else he thinks this process is for. He can just say, well, no, I'm not going to answer any of these questions. Yeah, yeah, the minister has to answer these questions. And if he doesn't, that's an indication of his failure as a, as a minister, but more importantly, their failure as a government. The member's time has expired. The Honourable Minister. Can the member repeat the, can the, member repeat the question? I'm not kidding about that. I was tempted to ask the member to repeat the question. So the question that he asked... Order. 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 Well, you know, I'm, I'm disappointed because now the member is, is heckling in, in the House, and I, I actually sort of thought he was serious. And, and then I just saw that little demonstration where he's yelling at, at people in the, in the loge and, and uh, getting, getting to... Well, now he's now he's just laughing out. Well, I'll wait for the member to bring himself to order. I, I, I actually thought he was serious, but clearly he's not serious. This is some sort of demonstrative politics for some sort of demonstrative politics uh, for him. But I was serious when I indicated to him that you know if he would wait for just a little bit of time, we could get him uh, the answers on the questions that he had regarding uh, uh, positions at uh, the different institutions and. Uh, true to my word, I said it would probably take about 10 to 15 minutes, and uh, it was about... Yeah, see, exactly right. About 10 or 15 minutes later, we actually have the answer. So, uh, you know, the member, of course, had he just, had he just um, taken my advice, not that I'm really here to give him advice, but had he just taken my advice and let us answer this uh, first thing tomorrow, uh, then he could have uh, fired off a bunch of other questions and gotten a bunch more answers. But he doesn't actually seem to be interested in answers. He seems to be interested in uh, ragging the puck on his own estimates process, which is an interesting strategy. I mean, I was critic for a long time, and uh, you know, I, I certainly, you know, listen, I did see ministers sometimes who I thought gave extended answers that were just intended to delay. I never, as a critic, tried to delay my own estimates process, which the critic seems to be uh, interested in doing, which is a fascinating strategy strategy to wait for uh, for a year to get into an estimates process and then decide to waste time on your own estimates process. So if that's the strategy he wants to employ, I suspect he has some reason for it. I can't figure it out. Maybe someday he'll explain it to me about why he's not actually interested in getting answers uh, to questions and he can enlighten me about why that's a good um, critic strategy. Uh, but because I committed to get him uh, some answers, I can indicate to him that all the posts are always filled in our correctional institutions. And that is because we have a pool of part-time staff, uh, corrections officers, that fill all vacancies so that no, rep no posts remain vacant. So if the member is concerned, which might be a rightful concern, that there are positions that are not being filled, uh, I can indicate to him that because of that pool of part-time staff, all of the, who are con or corrections officers, all of the uh, posts are, are always filled in our correctional institutions, and that would include, as the member asked, the Headingley Correctional Center, the Manitoba Youth Center, the Remand Center, the um, Brandon Correctional Center, Milner Ridge Correctional Center, the PAW, and the Women's 
uh, correctional center. So yes, while there um, are sometimes posted vacancies, which is not an unusual thing to have posted uh, vacancies at well, any uh, correctional institution or frankly any institution, um, because we have the pool of part-time staff, um, those uh, women and men who serve uh, very ably, ably in um, corrections, all of the posts are always filled. Now, if the member opposite having gotten the answer to the question um, that I would have provided to him first thing tomorrow, um, but who he said was quite patient in wanting to wait for 10 or 15 minutes for the answer and then went on a critic tirade uh, to try to filibuster his own estimates process for reasons that still escape me. If the member opposite wants to go back to uh, the question that he had prior to the tirade and uh, after uh, the, um, the question that he asked, which I've now just given him the answer to, I'm happy to uh, try to endeavor to get him the information. However, if he wants to uh, filibuster the rest of his estimates process, I'm happy to ha hear him filibuster the rest of, es of the estimates process. I don't know why he would do that. Probably in the fullness of time he'll explain that to me. It'll all become clear. But having served in opposition longer than anybody should serve in opposition uh, for the 16 years that I was uh, in his seat, it is absolutely mystifying to me that a member comes as a critic and asks questions that he doesn't actually want answers to. The Honourable Member for Concordia. Well, we do want answers to the questions. That's why I had to ask them a second time, because the minister said he wasn't going to answer them. and. Um, I mean, it's very surprising that uh, he would consider that ragging the puck, asking questions. Like, what, what does he think estimates is? I'm asking questions. I had to ask them twice if he thought that that was unnecessary. Maybe he shouldn't have said on the record here in this committee that he wasn't going to answer the questions that were asked of him in this committee. And once again, we, we you know, have a situation where he didn't even answer the question that he said would take 10, 15 minutes. It's been 10, 15 minutes, and he's not answering the question. He's saying that, talking about unfilled shifts, we're talking about positions. The minister obviously has, answer, uh, has access to that information, right? He comes up with these, these uh, pieces of little nuggets of information, but refuses to answer the questions. So he, he's indicated that he's going to answer all of the questions here. He's taking them on notice. He's going to answer them tomorrow in written form, I guess. That's what he said originally. So uh, maybe that's when we're going to get it because we're at the end of the day. We're at the end of the day and the minister has spent the entire day, uh, you know, talking around all of these questions rather than just like these are straightforward questions. I can understand the minister wants to make like a political point at the end, but the data is just the data. So give it to the people of Manitoba, and then, you know, we can have the political debate. That's what we're trying to do here. So again, can the minister give us a uh, broken down by individual correctional center? Uh, we're, we're talking about the number of positions that have, uh, that have been... Um, uh, that are unf unfilled, not the shifts in corrections. So I, I do want to know what the turnover rate has been and if the minister could give those specific numbers and the, uh, and the vacancy rates.
The Honourable Minister. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Chairperson. So, of course, you know, the member was incorrect. I've not indicated that I would not uh, answer uh, questions, um, but they have to be uh, staged in a way that we can actually understand what the member is asking, uh, as opposed to uh, him saying that he's waiting for an answer and then shooting off five other questions in the midst of waiting for an answer. So I provided him the answer uh, that indicates that, you know, the positions are all filled. Um, within the individual corrections institutions, which I think is important information. Maybe the member doesn't feel that's important. And yes, at the beginning of this process, there were uh, several things which we indicated that we would provide him a written response. Uh, I don't think I said tomorrow, but obviously we always do our best in terms of getting uh, the response. And, and the are being 5 p.m. Committee rise, call on the speaker. The hour being 5 p.m. This house is adjourned and stands adjourned until tomorrow at 1.30 p.m. Have a good evening, everybody.